returning to our home of Tristram after the failed bloody war against Westmarch. We're shocked to see the once thriving settlement is now a shadow of its former glory, seeking out the scattered remnants for clues on the obvious tragedy that befell the town. We first speak to a familiar face, Ogden, the tavern owner, who exclaims, Thank goodness you've returned. Much has changed since you lived here, my friend. All was peaceful until the Dark Riders came and destroyed our village. Many were cut down where they stood, and those who took up arms were slain or, or dragged away to become slaves, or worse. The church at the edge of town has been desecrated and is being used for dark rituals. The screams that echo in the night are inhuman, but some of our townsfolk may yet survive. Follow the path that lies between my tavern and the blacksmith's shop to find the church and save who you can. Perhaps I can tell you more if we speak again. Good luck. We know what we must do and head to the church by the edge of town, once a revered holy site, and steel ourselves to witnessing a foul desecration therein. The original bloody tale of the Butcher can be started by approaching the wounded townsman, just outside of the cathedral at the edge of Tristram. Please, listen to me. The Archbishop Lazarus, he led us down here to find the lost prince. The bastard led us into a trap. Now everyone is dead, killed by a demon he called the Butcher. Avenge us! Find this Butcher and slay him so that our souls may finally rest. Your death will be avenged. Agreeing to take on this butcher and avenge the nameless townsmen, we ready ourselves for the horrors ahead. The sanctity of this place has been fouled. And as with the final release, we hack through swaths of fallen skeletons and other hellspawn, making our way deeper in the cathedral to level two, where the butcher's lair is rumored to reside. However, to get the full scope of this quest, I think it's best we first head to the townsfolk of Tristram to see if they have any guiding words on how to fell this frightening foe. We first head to the innkeeper Ogden for rumours. Greetings, good master. Welcome to the Tavern of the Rising Sun. Farnham has mumbled something about a hulking brute who wielded a fierce weapon. I believe he called him a butcher. Although he doesn't know much, our best lead seems to be, according to Ogden, Farnham. The drunk. Can't a fellow drink in peace? Big, big cleaver, killing all my friends. Couldn't stab him. Had to run away. Couldn't save them. Trapped in a room with so many bodies. So many friends. No! No, you can't let me go back there. I won't let you take me. Too much pain. Too many dead. Can't get the blood out of my eyes, my mouth. Oh. It's evident that this demon still haunts Farnham's memories with his cries of lost friends and bodies strewn about. It's no wonder he tries to find solace in the drink and forget a comfort we are not permitted. So we head to the resident scholar Decker Kane for wisdom. Seems that the Archbishop Lazarus goaded many of the townsmen into venturing into the labyrinth to find the king's missing son. He played upon their fears and whipped them into a frenzied mob. None of them were prepared for what lay within the cold earth. Lazarus abandoned them down there, left in the clutches of unspeakable horrors to die. So the treacherous Lazarus is in league with the demons. Maybe we need a more grounded strategy from a man who is well versed on steel cleaving flesh. So we head to Griswold, the blacksmith, to get his take. Well, what can I do for you? I saw what Farnham calls the Butcher as it swathed a path through the bodies of my friends. Oh, he swung a cleaver as large as an axe, hewing limbs and cutting down brave men where they stood. I was separated from the fray by a host of small screeching demons, and somehow found the stairway leading out. I never saw that hideous beast again, but his blood-stained visage haunts me to this day. It's chilling to think that this butcher has a pack of minions waiting down in his lair for us. We'll definitely need healing and supplies, and so we head to Pepin the Healer. By the light I know of this vile demon, 
There were many that bore the scars of his wrath upon their bodies when the few survivors of the charge led by Lazarus crawled from the cathedral. I don't know what he used to slice open his victims, but it could not have been of this world. It left wounds festering with disease, and even I found them almost impossible to treat. Beware if you plan to battle this fiend. <laughs> Fantastic. Crawling out of the cathedral with wounds that won't heal, that's something to look forward to. Speaking of losing limbs, maybe Wirt knows something of this butcher. I know more than you think about that grizzly fiend. His little friends got a hold of me and managed to get my leg before Griswold pulled me out of that hole. I'll put it bluntly. Kill him before he kills you and adds your corpse to his collection. I don't know what Wirt was doing in that cathedral, but that is such a morbid thought to think that the butcher's minions tore his leg off his body before he was saved. Good day. How may I serve you? When Farnham said something about a butcher killing people, I immediately discounted it. But since you brought it up, maybe it is true. Although Gillian thought it was just a fairy tale of the drunkard Farnham, everything points to this harrowing tale as being true, and that the townsfolk are unfortunately a part of this living nightmare. So, to fight evil, we want to consult somebody well-versed in the darker arts and speak to Adria the Witch. The Butcher is a sadistic creature that delights in the torture and pain of others. You have seen his handiwork in the drunkard Farnham. His destruction will do much to ensure the safety of this village. Adria agrees that killing this butcher is a net positive for the light. With that, we head back down to the cathedral, resolute in our duty to destroy this foul demon. Not before giving one last final acknowledgement to the fallen townsmen before we head in. Your death will be avenged. After dealing with the scores of wicked demons doing their best to perish us prematurely, we finally happen upon what can only be described as the fabled Butcher's Lair. Adorned with corpses mounted on pikes, gore and flesh strewn about in an unholy decorative fashion as we steal ourselves and tepidly open the door to his lair. Nothing. No butcher rushing us. No familiar exclamation of, ah, fresh meat. Nothing. But what does that mean? Where has the butcher hidden? For answers and resupplies, we promptly head back to town. After heading to level 2, we see that Wirt has a new quest icon, and approaching him, he says, You're over, psst! Chamber Butcher, the From Spell Portal Town, the cast! Saying, Am I what see? Poor Wirt. We try and decipher his words further, to which he frustratedly states, Get out, it figured you haven't! Understand, could you even so simple it make to try die? Chamber Butcher the From Spell Portal Town Aghast! Hmm, this is curious. It's also started a further quest, the Butcher's Chamber, and we should find out what we can from the other townsfolk. What is talking backwards again? Oh, I hate it when he does that. I don't have time to help you decipher his riddle, but I will tell you one thing. Don't get involved with that rapscallion. Despite Ogden's protest for us to not get involved, we do have a key clue. Wirt is talking backwards. Maybe Cain knows more. You must have been speaking with Wirt. His is a sad story indeed. That poor child was taken into the labyrinth by the demons, ripped from the very arms of his mother, Canus. May her soul rest in peace. The boy managed to escape, but only after they had chewed off his leg. And he has not been quite sane since. He often speaks in riddles, but his knowledge of the labyrinth may hold some truth. So it seems we learn of Paul Wirt's fate once and for all, having lost his limb, and, and it seems his character wasn't going to be just a part grifter, but also half mad from the experience. Maybe having one rambling townsperson was enough, and with that, we should consult poor Farnham, who has also been touched by his experience with the butcher. <laughs> no, you can't let me go back there. I won't let you take me. Too much pain. Too many dead. <laughs> can't get the blood out of my eyes. 
My mouth! <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say. This is one of the most disturbing voice lines in the entire game for me. And it's a shame that it was cut and that it happened to him. Heading to Pepin next, he says, I suppose it isn't beyond the realm of possibility if you could bear being in that room again. Your description of the atrocities committed there would be enough to keep me far from it. Pepin is right. The room seems to also be a key. Now, before I head back to work to decipher his hidden message, I should consult the other villagers. I was with Fern on that night that Lazarus led us into the labyrinth. I never saw the Archbishop again, and I may not have survived if Farnham was not at my side. I fear that the attack left his soul as crippled as, well, another did my leg. I cannot fight this battle for him now. But uh, what if I could? So Farnham saved Griswold. It's funny how Gillian superficially writes Farnham off as a gibbering drunk, yet he saved the town's blacksmith, who in turn is actually pivotal for our own success. Speaking of Jillian the barmaid. How could you even think of going back to that place? Unfortunately, we are headed back to that very place. Stocking up on supplies, we speak to Adria once more, who remarks. The lair of the butcher is steeped in demonic power and casting any spell of passage there could cause unexpected results. Ah. So, casting a spell of passage, this is starting to make more sense. Get out it figured you haven't! Understand, could you even so simple it make to try die? Chamber Butcher the From Spell Portal Town aghast! Listening to Wirt's instructions once more, it is evident we must cast a town portal in the Butcher's Lair for unexpected results. We race back to the Butcher's Lair with a spell in hand and cast it to be met with an ominous red glowing portal, and we step in. The house is burning and a decapitated body on the rocky floor. This can only be the true butcher's lair. Fighting our way through dozens of devilkin, we find the main room's door is barred. Looks like it's rusted shut. However, we search around and find Burning Dead guarding a switch in the northwestern room, unlocking the previously impassable main door. As we enter, we're also shown a cutscene of perhaps what awaits us in this lair. The door barred by Devilkin as we fight our way in, and then we hear the butcher's familiar line as he rushes us. Ah, fresh meat. <laughs> As the Beelzebub mod enhances enemies, the Butcher boasts bloodlust and a severe knockback from his cleaver, which nearly cleaves us clean in two where we stand and we back up to make sure that we take care of his minions before attempting to stand our ground. Which in itself seems to be a mistake as the Butcher's hefts are swathed through armor and weapons alike and knocks us backwards through doors. Gone is the safety of the greats to protect us as we used to lob arrows in the original game outside of harm's reach and no stone curse scrolls in our inventory to try and make this quest easier. It looks like we're going to do this the hard way. The butcher hacking at us shows his bloodlust also nets him life replenish making him a particularly nasty foe to burn down. Nevertheless with persistence and a lot of chunks out of our hide we finally Put down the butcher. The spirits of the dead are now avenged. As the butcher gasps its last breath, Aiden claims that the spirits of his victims are avenged. On his body, we find random loot being an unidentified spiked club, short sword, and his infamous unique cleaver, which is a very powerful weapon at this level. With that and looting the rest of his lair, we promptly leave to identify and equip our newly found loot. Although we have somewhat aided the deceased victims of the butcher. Butcher. I cannot help but think of the living. Poor Farnham driven to the drink as Griswold hopelessly looks on and Gillian turning her nose down at it. But more sad is the effects that it's had on Wirt. Now that we know who's ripped from his mother's arms and his leg was gnawed clean off the bone. Please, you must hurry. Every hour that passes brings us closer to having no water to drink. We cannot survive for long without your help. 
After witnessing the horrors that lie inside the labyrinth just below Tristram's Cathedral and returning to town for the first time for healing and respite, we pause briefly and notice the water in the center of town has turned a disturbing brown and is unmistakably tainted. Curious, we see Pepin, the healer for answers, who pleads, I'm glad I caught up to you in time. Our wells have become brackish and stagnant, and some of the townspeople have become ill drinking from them. Our reserves of fresh water are quickly running dry. I believe that there is a passage that leads to the springs that serve our town. Please find what has caused this calamity, or we all will surely perish. Water being a vital resource to human survival. Is this failing of the water an act of war to weaken the town? Or is something tainted the water itself? We seek out the scholar, Deckard Cain, by the stagnant pool who shares. Mm. I don't know what I can really tell you about this that will be of any help. The water that fills our wells comes from an underground spring. I have heard of a tunnel that leads to a great lake. Perhaps they are one and the same. Unfortunately, I do not know what would cause our water supply to be tainted. Well, at least we know what we're looking for. A tunnel and a great lake. Perhaps the man most acquainted with liquid in town, Farnham the Drunk, has some words of wisdom on the matter. <laughs> you drink water? Touché. We trudge back through to the center of town, feeling a mite parched in the heat of Griswold the blacksmith's forge, as he relays. Heaven has told ye the truth. We will need fresh water badly, and soon. Uh, I've tried to clear one of the smaller wells, but it reeks of stagnant filth. It must be getting clogged at the source. Clogged at the source. I don't like to imagine what the clogger is, but a demon's hide would be enough to taint any form of purity. We head next to the tavern owner and supplier of food and drink, Ogden, for a status report, and he says, I have always tried to keep a large supply of foodstuffs and drink in our storage cellar, but with the entire town having no source of fresh water, even our stores will soon run dry. Please, do what you can, or I don't know what we will do. I fear if we don't purify the water source soon, the town will be weakened beyond repair. That and Farnham will probably drink through Ogden's mead in a matter of minutes if he catches wind of this. It's then we turn to the barmaid Gillian, standing out front of her grandmother's house, and she entreats. My grandmother is very weak, and Garda says that we cannot drink the water from the wells. Please, can you do something to help us? It seems it's already begun. Wasting no time, we raced past Wirt for any kernel of information which he shares. For once, I'm with you. My business runs dry, so to speak, if I have no market to sell to. You better find out what is going on, and soon. Agreed. A last stop before searching out the passage lie with the witch, Adria, in a small shack at the edge of town. As if anticipating our arrival, she stands, hands on hips, and remarks before we ask, People of Tristram will die if you cannot restore fresh water to their wells. Know this, demons are at the heart of this matter, but they remain ignorant of what they have spawned. So it is demons, as we feared. But Adrias has somehow divined that they are ignorant of their doing. This may work to our advantage, as they would no doubt be lax in their defenses if they are indeed unaware of the devastation the simple act of withholding water to humans has wrought. With no time to lose, we head back into the second level of the cathedral, mind racing with the thought of what exactly could have tainted the town well. On the second level of the cathedral, we fight through a myriad of enemies actively trying to bar our path, including ghouls, fiends, hidden, and scavengers. Close to the pile of bodies we leave in our wake, in the northeastern side of the room lie a waypoint, and next to it a wall that has been eroded and what appears to be a tunnel inside. Upon entering the tunnel, we see infrastructure of wood beams holding up the small cavern as if it were man-made. We move then northeast and are greeted in a large opening, revealing the blood orange devilkin and their carver brethren waiting in the shadows to strike. A silent confirmation we are pressing in the right direction. 
heading northeast into the narrow shaft, a more fallen, and curiously aided by the weakest of the Khazra, the Flesh Clan Goat Men. <laughs> But what are they doing here? As we ponder the question and move up the main tunnel, we make out through the barely lit rocky facade the shapes of about a score of fallen fiends. Although their hooked swords and pointed spears could easily drop us where we stand, their cowardly disposition sees them flee every time we ourselves strike down one of their carver kin. After the fallen are no more a score, but instead dripping ichor underfoot, we step through the gore and head into a large central cavern and see a lake of putrid yellow that flows in the middle of the room, glowing in an unnatural hue, attracting the ambling denizens therein. No doubt, once the river that fed into the well. As we cut a swath through the remaining fallen and goat men, we notice a unique Khazra archer slinging arrows from the lip of the cavern Creek. Stalking him down as he retreats, we see his body oozes with open wounds and bright blood drips from his flesh. Known as Ramak the Poisoner, his accursed hide must be, at least partially, responsible for the tainting of the waters below. Giving Ramak no quarter, we clench our mace tight, dodging arrows as we beat his horned head in and blue fluid sprays from his fallen frame. Curiously, the blood matches the river's true waters as the sickness begins to abate. Seemingly demonic in permeance rather than a physical taint. With Remark fallen, we acquire the axe off his corpse and make our way topside to relay the findings to Pepin the healer once more. In town, we take a brief stop by the well in the thoroughfare and see that indeed the taint has subsided. Witnessing the change, Pepin beckons to us and adulates. What's that you say? The mere presence of the demons has caused the water to become tainted? Oh, truly a great evil lurks beneath our town, but your perseverance and courage gives us hope. Please, take this ring. Perhaps it will aid you in the destruction of such vile creatures. With that, the town again has access to fresh water, and we receive a unique ring of truth from Pepin, and a curious to its properties, taking it to Kane, who identifies oh, it for friend. us, for a fee, a as it boasts plus 10 hit points, minus 1 damage from enemies, and plus 10% resist all. A great ring to be sure, as we will take any aid in our quest to uncover the lurking evil below the cathedral. However, we fear that the stagnant stew in a well is the least of the town of Tristram's worries in the coming days. This is the story of the curse of King Leoric and the quest's original appearance in Diablo 1. After initially returning to the decimated town of Tristram and witnessing the horrors that befell the townspeople underneath the once holy site of the cathedral, we emerge from the monastery's second level in need of respite, and it's then that we're waved down by Ogden, the tavern owner, who finally reveals the fate of our father, the once beloved King Leoric, and our brother, Prince Albrecht. Two names no man has dared to utter in our presence. Until now. The village needs your help, good master. Some months ago, King Leoric's son, Prince Albrecht, was kidnapped. The king went into a rage and scoured the village for his missing child. With each passing day, Leoric seemed to slip deeper into madness. He sought to blame innocent townsfolk for the boy's disappearance and had them brutally executed. Less than half of us survived his insanity. The king's knights and priests tried to placate him, but he turned against them and, sadly, they were forced to kill him. With his dying breath, the king called down a terrible curse upon his former followers. He vowed that they would serve him in darkness forever. This is where things take an even darker twist than I thought possible. Our former king has risen from his eternal sleep and now commands a legion of undead minions within the labyrinth. His body was buried in a tomb three levels beneath the cathedral. Please, good master, put his soul at ease by destroying his now cursed form. What foul black magic is this? The Leoric we knew was a benevolent ruler beloved by his people. 
None of this makes sense. We swear we shall find our younger brother and make a beeline to the town's aging scholar, Deckard Kane, standing by his familiar well, hoping he can shed light on what madness took our once pious father and led to the tragedy that befell our family and the entire town of Tristram. Ah, the story of our king, is it? The tragic fall of Leoric was a harsh blow to this land. The people always loved the king, and now they live in mortal fear of him. The question that I keep asking myself is how he could have fallen so far from the light, as Leoric had always been the holiest of men. Only the vilest powers of hell could so utterly destroy a man from within. I noticed that neither Ogden nor Cain called Leoric our father. Whatever demonic influence that holds him must be great if they dare not utter our relation in fear of evoking a wretched curse. Or worse, maybe dare relive a memory of a better time. We then head next to the blacksmith Griswold by his forge and his shares. I made many of the weapons and most of the armor that King Leoric used to outfit his knights. I even crafted a huge two-handed sword of the finest mithril for him, as well as a field crown to match. I uh, still cannot believe how he died, but it must have been some sinister force that drove him insane! A mithril two-handed sword, which is half the weight of steel and a fine weapon, but a crown to battle? Whatever Leoric's foe, it sounds like he wanted to face it in the light and on the battlefield. Far from the light and the ears of others, we search out Farnham, now colloquially known as the Town Drunk, as he's plopped by his favorite rock, Farnham being a once decent warrior and loyal subject to the crown. We tepidly broach the subject of the Skeleton King and Farnham scoffs. I don't care about that. Listen, no skeleton is gonna be my king. Leoric is king, king. So you hear me? Hail to the king. We almost envy Farnham's denial of what's transpired and even his rum-soaked stupor. However, we press on and see Pepin the healer outside his hut who expounds. The loss of his son was too much for King Leoric. I did what I could to ease his madness, but in the end, it overcame him. A black curse has hung over this kingdom from that day forward. But perhaps if you were to free his spirit from his earthly prison, the curse would be lifted. Of all the people to deal with this, why me? They won't even look us in the eye, let alone acknowledge our shared heritage. Maybe they have good reason to be afraid. And I'm the only ignorant fool left in this town. We then turn to Jillian the barmaid out front of, his gran out front of her grandma's hut. And she says, I don't like to think about how the king died. I like to remember him for the kind and just ruler that he was. His death was so sad and seemed very wrong somehow. Thankful for the true memory of our father to be recalled just once more before we face down the horrors inside the crypt. On our way out of town, we seek out the wisdom of children as Wirt the peg-legged boy eyes from his tree and states flatly, Look, I am running a business here. I don't sell information, and I don't care about some king that's been dead longer than I've been alive. If you need something to use against this king of the undead, then I can help you out. We pause for a moment, shocked at the title, King of the Undead, the King of Condorus. We momentarily regain our composure and cast our eye to the shack on the outskirts of town. Perhaps Adria the Witch and her dark arts are familiar with our father's curse, to which she greets us in front of the shack and says, The dead who walk among the living follow the cursed king. He holds the power to raise yet more warriors for an ever-growing army of the undead. If you do not stop his reign, he will surely march across this land and slay all who still live here. So, this unholy skeleton king, Leoric, naught but in name, has the power to raise the undead, granting him subjects in death, standing in stark contrast against what he stood for in life. Grim tidings indeed. This doesn't sound like a father at all, but a curse that we must abolish. 
We steal our resolve, unsure what to expect as we bury our emotions deep within lest they betray us as we head into the depths of the cathedral once more. Down in level 3, we're met with a score of demons, varying in type from scavengers, undead archers with their flaming arrows, the ever-cowardly fallen, jabbing and shrieking with their spears, and the disappearing hidden, led by a unique called Moon Drinker. As we fell his brethren and stalk down Moon Drinker one, once slain, ah! we spy near his corpse an unfamiliar tomb, its entrance guarded by two solemn statues representing the fallen Leoric. This is, no doubt, where the bones of our father lay. We apprehensively step inside and hear a voice that says, The warmth of life has entered my tomb. Prepare yourself, mortal to serve my master for eternity. <laughs> our greatest fear was that our father was somehow behind the misfortunes of the town. However, that fades. This skeleton king doesn't recognize us as his son at all. All it sees is another potential minion for its ever-growing army of the undead, and this elusive master it speaks of. We know what we have to do, and with a bone-crushing mace in hand, we step further inside the tomb. As we push forward, we rush the archers, only to see their kin are safely hidden behind a grate. Yet deftly, we hear the twang of their bowstrings that rain down arrows upon us from the safety of their nest. Frustrated, we turn to the western door and kick it in, in looking for an alternate path. Again, we are met with burning dead and a corpse bow. Once fallen, we check the crypt, but it's not Leorix. However, there is a lever by it that reveals dead switches to open the grate. Backtracking into the main area, we destroy burning skeleton captains. As we head into the main chamber, filled with undead, we spy a tomb no doubt of the skeleton king in the middle of the room, and behind it moves forward the largest skeleton we've ever seen, at least twice as big as any man, wielding a mithril sword of unholy heft, as well as a breast of armor and a crown atop its head, raising allies casually as it stalks forward and swings its sword at us as its minions attempt to corner us. We make a dash for the archers first, hacking frantically as we sidestep his army, but are caught in the southeast corner by a sarcophagus. There the king presses his attack, raising minions as we desperately try to fell we're only saved by the sheer brute force of his sword as it makes contact with our shield, knocking us back, and we retreat and pick off his minions one by one. When we finally face the Skeleton King, we think it's on our terms, but we're now badly fatigued and out of options as we start to frantically heal, but to no avail as we realize he possesses the ability of vampirism in this drawing life with every blow he rains down on us. He does not slow with his cold, calculated swinging of his sword. His minions trickle into the fray and fall again, resurrected by their dark master. And it's clear that our soft, fallible flesh is a weakness the skeleton army does not share. Forced to flee, we hear the Skeleton King gleefully resurrect the undead in our wake, almost mockingly awaiting our return. We make a beeline for town and see Pepin for much needed healing, greedily buying up his potions as this is our only option at this point, to weather Leoric's attacks and outheal his sickening vampirism. We turn to Ogden, who's standing by Pepin, and he says, I told you, good master, the king was entombed three levels below. He's down there, waiting in the putrid darkness for his chance to destroy this land. We have no doubt in our minds that Ogden's right. If we do not fell Leoric, Tristram will be overrun in a matter of days. With refreshed weaponry, potions, we head back down to the tomb to face the skeleton king, Leoric, once more. Once inside the tomb, Leoric refuses to relent for even a second, barreling down on us with his newly raised minions, and although we are well stocked, he still has 
surprise is in store. We realize his vampirism not only drains life, but also magicka as well. There is no portaling out of here, and we're forced once again to face him on his terms in a war of attrition. As he swings down his massive mithril sword, it bites into our shield, and his skeleton minions rise over and over to aid him in his attack. Becoming weary from his assault, once again our attention flickers and we see his unrelenting vampirism will sap us of our strength if we're not vigilant. Thirstily gulping down Pepin's potions between frantic swings of our mace, we finally beat down the Skeleton King's offense with our own bashing of our mace. And we say, without even thinking, Rest well, Leoric. I'll find your son. Strange even forced to face our own father. As the ghoulies visage of his former self, we don't even allow our emotions to get the better of us for a second, as we sense we are being watched by an even more malevolent force, delighting in our macabre mission, hoping that we will break. After announcing we will find Ulbricht, we search Leoric's tomb further, freeing bodies crucified that were littered about and finding his own guarded treasure in a northern room. With a few unique items under our belt, we move to leave the tomb, but then we realize we got to check Leoric himself. On his skeletal corpse, we see what Griswold had spoken of, his glorious field crown. Our birthright by all accounts, but more so a symbol of the righteous man Leoric once was. With the crown in hand, we head back to town and see Ogden once more, who says, The curse of our king is past, but I fear that it was only part of a greater evil at work. However, we may yet be saved from the darkness that consumes our land, for your victory is a good omen. May light guide you on your way, good master. We acknowledge Ogden's words and pray we have freed our father Leoric once and for all from his eternal misery and damnation. Let the light be merciful as our family and the town of Tristram has suffered enough. Seeing Cain quickly, we toss him the crown and he tells us that indeed it would grant us the boon of five points of lifesteal on our own enemies. Although we wouldn't wear the crown in the best of times, let alone when such misery has befallen the land as it seems ostentatious, we do however place the field crown on our head as a sign that we will pick up where our good father Leoric left off before he had succumbed to evil, and that we too shall battle the greater darkness Ogden spoke of. Proud to be Aiden, son of Leoric, and Prince of Condoras. After returning from the third level of Tristram's Cathedral and heading into town, the tavern owner Ogden, looking befuddled, apprehensively approaches us, relaying a puzzling tale. Master, I have a strange experience to relate. I know that you have a great knowledge of those monstrosities that inhabit the labyrinth, and this is something that I cannot understand for the very life of me. I was awakened during the night by a scraping sound just outside of my tavern. When I looked out from my bedroom, I saw the shapes of small demon-like creatures in the inn yard. After a short time they ran off, but not before stealing the sign to my inn. I don't know why the demons would steal my sign, but leave my family in peace. Tis strange, no? Demons stealing a sign? But why? Surely that kind of petty theft is below even a demon and more in line with a bored youth. Still, we do not discount his story so quickly and begin to canvas the town for clues, starting with his barmaid, Jillian, standing in her grandmother's doorway, who says, Oh my, is that where the sign went? My grandmother and I must have slept right through the whole thing. Thank the light that those monsters didn't attack the inn. Thank the light indeed. To think children have been dragged into the labyrinth in the middle of the night, but a sign? Speaking of children, we spy Wirt, the peg-legged boy, a few paces from us, eavesdropping, and question. What? Is he saying I took that? I suppose that Griswold is on his side too. Look, I got over simple sign-stealing months ago. You can't turn a profit on a piece of wood. 
Well, I actually wasn't thinking Wirt could hobble away in time, but he did just admit to pilfering signs but a few months back. Maybe his goal to whisk Jillian away from this accursed town has put him on the mostly straight and narrow path. Or maybe he got his grubby little fingers on that sign and we should shake a confession out of him. Holding back from a darker path, though Wirt does like to push us, we then see Pebbin the healer and ask if he saw anything. And he exclaims, My goodness, demons running about the village at night, pillaging our homes, is nothing sacred? I hope that Ogden and Garda are all right. I suppose that they would come to see me if they were hurt. We're just glad everyone is okay. Mostly everyone. Maybe the wild card, Farnham the Drunk, has secretly had his eye on the sign for being locked out of the meat hall one too many times. It seems it's time for our toughest quest yet. Interrogate a sourced up Farnham. We lean down to his head height and feel a, a brewery-like waft hit us and whisper, tell us where the sign is, Farnham. You know what I think? Somebody took that sign. They're gonna want lots of money for it. If I was Ogden, well, I'm not. But if I was, I'd just buy a new sign with some pretty drawing on it. Maybe a nice mug of ale. Ooh, or a piece of cheese. Well, okay. Standing up, we reassess. Note to self. It wasn't Farnham. Second, buy some cheese and ale. Damn, Farnham really sells the dream there. Perhaps we need the grounded wisdom of the scholar Deckard Kane, who is just a few feet from the scene of the crime, but he too puzzles. I see that this strange behavior puzzles you as well. I would surmise that since many demons fear the light of the sun and believe that it holds great power, it may be that the rising sun depicted on the sign you speak of has led them to believe that it too holds some arcane powers. Hmm, perhaps they are not all as smart as we had feared. Really? So that's why demons only scurry about at night. And I thought it was their cowardice, but this makes perfect sense. That the light itself offends their senses, yet causes a twisted reverence for what they fear. We shall no doubt find out soon enough. Before we head out of town, we briskly speak to Griswold the blacksmith, who himself scoffs. Demons stole Ogden's sign, you say? That doesn't sound much like the atrocities I've heard of or seen. Demons are concerned with ripping out your heart, not your signpost. Look. Griswold, we're on the same page. Demons have slaughtered half the village recently, and sending a scout party for a sign sounds almost demented. Certainly absurd, but if there is anyone who may understand the inner workings of demons, it's Adria the Witch. And we head to her shack on the outskirts of town, and she comments, No mortal can truly understand the mind of the demon. Never let their erratic actions confuse you, as that too may be their plan. Wow, we are now officially more confused than ever, uncertain of anything, or if Adria isn't a demon cooking up a spell thanks to her little Freudian slip. Mentally, we mark her name down as a suspect just under words and head back into the labyrinth, still in quiet disbelief anybody could think it was a demon, to source this errant sign. Down by level four, we do happen across a curious sight, an overlord loitering by a structure that appears to lead to the catacombs below. And as we contend with the brute and its companion, a unique skeleton, Mad-Eye the Dead, as well as a hidden watching the commotion from the sidelines. But what is an overlord doing on this level? Wrestling with the thought and unopposed, we round the corner and see a lone dark one leader named Snotspill in front of a grate barring the entrance to the catacombs. Although the walls are bloody and he is armed, he doesn't attack us. And more astonishingly, he can speak. Hey, you that one that kill all. You get me magic banner or we attack. You no live with life. You kill big uglies and give back magic. Go past corner and door, find uglies. You give, you go. It sounds like Cain was actually right, and they believe it was a magical artifact, worshipped for its sun properties. We decide to query the fallen once more, but he simply states, You kill uglies! Get banner! You pray to me, or else! 
Although a solo dark one isn't too much of a threat, we do want that banner back and clearly something much stronger safeguards the aforementioned treasure. If only Ogden were here to see this. On the northern side of the structure, we find an opening with a gaggle of overlords lying in wait. They do fit the description of Big Ugly and clearly they think they're sitting on a bountiful treasure with how vehemently they guard the room. Sure enough, the last of their kin stands guard by a chest that is no doubt their coveted treasure. We manage to bash his flabby frame in and open the chest which reveals Ogden's cumbersome sign. Making room to heft it back to town, we see the familiar rising sun intact and the bottom of the sign damaged as it's been haphazardly ripped from its resting place. However, we are confronted now with two very distinct choices to make. The first is to return the sign to Ogden. However, the amiable snot spell did encourage us threateningly to bring him his magic banner, which is actually possible. So questionably, we throw our lot in with the burning hells and head back to the Dark One leader, where he excitedly exclaims, You give? Yes, good. Go now, we turn, we kill all with big magic. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Snotspill, mad with sign power, has a throng of dark ones lying in wait behind a false wall, which rush us as our reward. Spurred on by their newly acquired light-based vigor, but luckily for us, they still scatter in cowardice if their brethren fall in battle. So we slay Snotspill, and the way to the catacombs is open to us. However, this will end the quest, and not really satisfactorily. We can't now surface the town and reveal to Ogden we tried throwing our lot in with the Dark Ones, which is probably for the best, but we also forgo a reward. So, if instead, when we get the sign, we don't see Snot Spill and return to Ogden in town, he says, Oh, we didn't have to bring back my sign, but I suppose that it does save me the expense of having another one made. Well, let me see. What could I give you as a fee for finding it? Hmm, what have we here? Oh yes, this cap was left in one of the rooms by a magician who stayed here some time ago. Perhaps it may be of some value to you. Although not much of a magician, the cap Harlequin's Crest is a formidable helm. Kane, the scholar, then reveals the cap does impart plus two to all attributes, armor class minus three, minus one damage from enemies, plus seven hit points, and plus seven mana. A strong contender for a mage, but you'd likely shatter like glass with a half decent hit. <laughs> it's not for a warrior, we think. And so we make our way back down to where Snot Spill stands and confront him, signless. Even without their totem in their possession, the wrath of Snot Spill and his minions does not wane, but their fate still remains the same. Not enough mana. As they fall, our path is now clear and we finally make our way into the noxious catacombs below. That stench, is it me? Or are there zombies down here? Still waiting for you to bring me that stone from the heavens. I know that I can make something powerful out of it. After fighting through the wretched droves of undead beneath the cathedral's fourth level, Back in town, we're beckoned over by Griswold, the blacksmith, for aid. Stay for a moment. I have a story you might find interesting. A caravan that was bound for the Eastern Kingdoms passed through here some time ago. It was supposedly carrying a piece of the heavens that had fallen to Earth. The caravan was ambushed by cloaked riders just north of here along the roadway. I searched the wreckage for this sky rock, but it was nowhere to be found. If you should find it, I believe that I can fashion something useful from it. 
There are tales of powerful factions to the east, no doubt coveting a boon, such as a supposed sky rock. But cloaked riders whisking it away under the guise of night sounds like it has fallen into the clutches of the burning hells. Curious, we ask the townsfolk of anything they've heard of late, starting with Adria the Witch. The Heaven Stone is very powerful, and were it any but Griswold who bid you find it, I would prevent it. He will harness its powers, and its use will be for the good of us all. We understand that this rock must be honed for good, but what type of power would have Adria forbid anybody bar Griswold use it? Speaking of trustworthy, we see Farnham the Drunk and query him on the matter despite his befuddled state, and he reveals. I used to have a nice ring. It was a really expensive one. Blue and green and red and silver. Don't remember what happened to it, though. I really miss that ring. That's great. You had a ring. But what about Skyrocks? Seeking further clues, we then turn to the town elder, Deckard Kane, who says, Griswold speaks of the Heaven Stone that was destined for the Enclave located in the east. It was being taken there for further study. This stone glowed with an energy that somehow granted vision beyond that which a normal man could possess. I do not know what secrets it holds, my friend, but finding this stone would certainly prove most valuable. Heaven stone? We knew the rock was from the sky, but a stone that grants a seer-like vision? No wonder this meteorite is so coveted. But why now? Would the heavens impart such a valuable stone? Pondering this, we then see Pepin the Healer, who warns. I don't know what it is they thought they could see with that rock, but I will say this. If rocks are falling from the sky, you would better be careful. Well, that's some Farnham-level insight there, Pep. Running out of leads, we then seek out Wirt, the peg-legged boy, by his familiar tree, who admits. If anyone can make something out of that rock, Griswold can. He knows what he is doing. And as much as I try to steal his customers, I respect the quality of his work. Wow. In the midst of a war for the very soul of Tristram, Wirt just thinks of profit. Next, we speak to Gillian the barmaid, curious if she's heard any rumors in the tavern, and she recalls. Well, a caravan of some very important people did stop here, but that was quite a while ago. They had strange accents and were starting on a long journey, as I recall. I don't see how you could hope to find anything that they would have been carrying. Strange accents? We don't know where in the east they could take this sky rock for study further, but the famous mage clans of the east could very well be the victims of the riders. Lastly, we see Ogden, the tavern owner, about the caravan, and he says, Caravan stopped here to take on some supplies for their journey to the east. I sold them quite an array of fresh fruits and some excellent sweetbreads that Garda had just finished baking. Shame what happened to them. Well, we can take some solace knowing that their last meal was sweet. Unfortunately, demons are probably feasting on their sweet breads as we speak. With that, we know what we have to do. Find this coveted skyrock of the heavens in the cathedral before it falls into the hands of a demon adept at utilizing its rumored heavenly powers for evil. Down in the catacombs below the cathedral, after wading through the scores of undead and demons alike, we find in the eastern part of a level, a large room filled with skeletons, shadow beasts, glooms, and even moon men archers are gathered together in what seems to be reverence for a large rock sitting atop a pedestal. After clearing the room and stalking down the last of the horror archers, we get a closer look at the object and proclaim, This must be what Griswold wanted. Hefting the girthy magic rock into our inventory, it looks to be nothing that we've actually seen before. And although we know it holds great power, it seems like just another rock. Although it looks a no doubt deceiving, we head back to Griswold, lugging the rock from the gloomy catacombs, and he states, Let me see that. Aye, aye, it is as I believed. Give me a moment. Ah, here you are. I arranged pieces of the stone within a silver ring that my father left me. Ah, I hope it serves you well. 
Taken aback, Griswold has not only fashioned the invaluable stone into a piece of functional jewellery for our fight against the Hells, but also set it into his father's ring. And we then see Kane about its properties, and he tells us it's an Empyrean band, which holds plus two to all attributes, plus 20% light radius, faster hit recovery, and absorbs half trap damage. Although we may not see the future, it is at least brighter knowing that the forces of hell will not hold the Skyrock's power as long as we have a hand in the matter. We are secretly astonished that somehow Farnham the Drunk, who we had instantly dismissed, had divined that this was indeed a ring of sea. Maybe he holds true sight, or maybe the light works in mysterious ways. While exploring the fourth level of the cathedral, we're assaulted by two skeletons guarding a sarcophagus. Although the plundered tomb only reveals a paltry few coins, we see a room to the south. Breaking through reveals a unique flesh clan goat man, as a smattering of enemies amble forward from the darkness below. After contending with the trio, we are free to turn to the fleshy Khazra, who surprisingly begs. Please, no hurt, no kill. Keep alive, and next time good bring to you. What trickery is this? Wary of deception, we raise our sword to the goatman's throat, and he further pleads. Nothing yet. Almost done. Very powerful, very strong. Live, live, no pain, and promise I keep. Although our initial instinct is to cut down this garbad, the weak, without a second thought, something stays our hand. Curiosity, perhaps, or perhaps the desperation in his voice was too honest for a demon. Pondering out newly uncharted waters, we clear out the room further. Garbad, again, makes no move to stop us killing his kin. Opening the door below to a library, we're licked by a long line of lightning. <laughs> nearly falling before the dozen or so fallen get their chance to try their own hand in the matter. After killing the fallen, we gather up an invaluable book of town portal and scroll of healing before leaving the room. We cautiously check in with Garbad, who then promises. Something for you I am making. Again, not kill Garbad. Live and give good. You'll take this as proof I keep word. It's then remarkably he gives us a full health potion, 616 gold, and an enchanted cape. Confused at the bounty in hand, we portal back to town, curious as to what the townsfolk have to make of this. Seeing the Elder Decker Kane about the cape, he identifies that it indeed imparts plus one to dexterity and has no hidden curse or ill effects. No other townsfolk, though, seem to have heard of talking demons, though that doesn't stop Griswold, the blacksmith, from embellishing about Axe's effect on errant demons. The axe? Aye, that's a good weapon. Balanced against any foe. Look how it cleaves the air. And then imagine a nice fat demon head in its path. Keep in mind, however, that it is slow to swing. But talk about dealing a heavy blow! With nothing really learnt about this phenomena, we then confront Garbad a final time about his promised item. Guard half down as he greets us delightedly and says, This too good for you. Very powerful. You want, you take. Treachery. Garbad then lunges at us, proving he was deceptively fast all along. As his mace rains down blows atop our shield, we are taken aback and look for better footing, but every time we think we have his rhythm clocked, he spins, catching us hard in the midsection with his mace. Fatigued, we move for the room below, opening a town portal in our wake, hoping to confuse the goat man as we catch our breath and down some much needed healing potions. But Garbat doesn't relent. He stalks through the door on his putrid hooves as we deliver the final blow to the ghastly goat and utter. Ah! 
I'm not impressed. On Garbad's corpse, we find a yellow belt and realize his body blows have our own sash in tatters. Providence, maybe, as we portal back to town to see the belt's properties before celebrating. It's then Kane identifies it as the Bitter Chain, with enhanced armor and plus four to dexterity, a boon for our defenses and replaces our cloth belt, but a bitter reminder to never trust a demon, especially the wretched goat men. I fear that the worms could soon overrun the village. Just the thought of those slimy beasts oozing into my house makes me want to be ill. Please, rid us of them. Once the player has entered level 5 of the cathedral, if you head back to town and approach Pepin, the healer, he pleads. Good hero, a moment of your time, please. While attending one of the townsfolk who had taken quite ill, I noticed something odd about his home. There were strange sounds and a sickly sweet smell rising from the cellar. Thinking perhaps these fumes had something to do with his sickness, I investigated. In his cellar were monstrous worms shifting and squirming up from the underground. I beg of you, slay these creatures before they can make their way into the town. I left the door to his house open for you. It is the one opposite of mine. It seems only a matter of time before the forces of hell made its way into Tristram. But worms, what a wretched thought. Worms burrowing under the town and just across from Pepin's house, no less. As we venture closer, we see indeed the door is open, the light is on, but no sign of slithering foes about. Before we head inside, I think it's best we talk to some of the townsfolk who may be better versed in extermination. So we head to the town scholar, Deckard Kane, who says, Worms that rise up from the ground? Many of the ancient writings speak of poisonous insects and foul creatures of the skies and seas plaguing mankind. It is no surprise that the very earth would offer up a similar peril now that the denizens of the underworld are upon us. This is a very real-world biblical take on the plague that has fell upon Tristram, although it doesn't give us much in terms of a solution. Luckily, however, Griswold meanders over during our conversation to give us his take on the events. I've seen no such things in my shop, but I will keep a close watch for them. Perhaps if they come this way, they won't take kindly to the fires of my forge. I'm glad that Griswold is unfazed and vigilant at the thought of slithering worms underneath foot. Now let's hope his forge can stave them off and they are not fire resistant. With that, we head to an unlikely ally who would have trouble with his wooden legs lack of equilibrium if besieged by worms. Wirt, the peg-legged boy, who says, <laughs> They have you hunting worms now? What's next? Leaf collecting? Picking up mushrooms? Look, friend, you have a whole church full of demons over there to worry about. I don't see how a few little worms could be so bad. While I agree with Wirt's initial assessment that worms don't sound bad compared to the legions of the Burning Hells, nevertheless, these worms pose a direct threat to Tristram and its residents. Also noted is his wry reference to collecting mushrooms, which refers to a level 9 quest black mushroom. Speaking of food, we should see what's cooking with Jillian the barmaid. Wait, before you say anything, my grandmother had a dream with giant slithering creatures in it. She also saw Pepin running from a house in the town. Do you think this means anything? I plumb forgot about Jillian's unseen grandmother in Diablo 1, seemingly with visions that are somewhat accurate. I wish we could consult her more directly for clues. With only a few people left to see, we head to Ogden about these worms and find out how his cellar, stocked full of food which has been vital to this town's survival, has been faring. That sounds quite disgusting, and I am afraid that I haven't heard anything about any worms. Perhaps Kane, the storyteller, could be of some help. Ogden, quite abrupt as usual these days, has a cold lead as we've also spoken to Kane already. But what about the saucy drunkard known as Farnham to the side of his tavern? 
<laughs> listen, listen. I don't even like worms. Don't tell me about your worms. I don't want your worms. Nope. No thanks. No worms for me. Well, yep. The feeling is mutual, Farnham. Leaving the town drunk to wretch in our wake as we head northeast out of town to a shack owned by Adria the Witch, hopefully for some worm extermination guidance. Seek out the domicile to which Pepin the Healer has directed you. It is there that your missions will become clear and your methods evident. It seems Adria trusts us to figure it out as our task is pretty straightforward. Head for the infested home and the solution supposedly will become clear. So we do just that. Approaching the eerily lit residence once more, we cautiously step inside. What? Foul work is this? It's quickly evident the worms have been busy burrowing far and wide under the town itself. With thick tunnels at least three to five men wide, this dungeon mimics the caves below the cathedral. It's just past the entrance we spy an errant worm patrolling. We wait until it's closer to assess what the threat is and also before it can alert its brethren. This creature seems more of a snake in appearance and mirrors the Azure Drake, if anything. Although the lair itself is somewhat fashioned like Juriel's lair, later seen in Diablo 2 aesthetically, and may have been an inspiration, as many of the cut quests in Diablo 1 turn out to be inspiration for Diablo 2 quests, that remains to be seen. Hacking our way through a score of these worms, spelled more aptly in the sense of a mythical dragon with a Y instead of the house variety O, we are set upon many that await in their hidden facades and false passages as they attempt to ambush us repeatedly, spitting acid and surrounding us in hopes we perish prematurely in their den of evil beneath the earth. <laughs> slogging our way deeper into the maze with many dead ends, hidden ambushes and worms aplenty, we finally spy what seems to be their ringleader, War Maggot the Mad. Girt by a gaggle of groupies, he rushes us in the midst of his kin. Although once we kill him and the remainder of the worms, Aiden remarks, the town is safe from this foul spawn. It was somewhat muffled due to the commotion the worms were making. The town is safe from this foul spawn. Now, with a new yellow sword and cloak, we head back to Decked Cane to identify the loot and grade its value, as it seems our task is finally being completed. The cloak itself turns out to be a gold item. Batskin's Cape, a cool name for a cloak, although its attributes are minus six the strength, increased armor six, fire hit damage three to six, plus 29% faster hit recovery and 9% faster walk speed. The stats are definitely not a boon for a warrior and a bit all over the shop, though admittedly I wouldn't mind the faster walk speed, something I pine for after playing Diablo successes. The yellow sword, named Rift Scythe, boasts plus 28 cold resist and light radius increase 17%. Nothing to write home about, unfortunately, as the Butcher's Cleaver at level 2 would outpace this tiny stabber. With that, we head back to Pepin for an update on the quest, who thanks us and says, Once again, you have saved this humble town from the encroaching evil. We are, as always, forever in your debt. Kind words from Pepin, but concerning is this quest. Why haven't the denizens of hell poured forth into Tristram yet? The worms could have easily felled the townsfolk and it's left us with a myriad of questions. This game has no guards for the cathedral doors and it's becoming more apparent that something more evil is waiting for us and the minions of the burning hells seem to be content to guard their dark master and wait for a more opportune time to strike. Wading through the scores of demons on the fifth floor of the catacombs below Tristram, our trusty sword breaks against the hide of a particularly nasty stone clan archer's hide. 
We bash him back with our shield and frantically reach for our axe to cleave his head in twain. Before we portal to town for repairs, we spot a curious structure with dual doors side by side. Foolhardy, we open the door to reveal a trio of horned demons lying in wait. The first of the demons falls, but the second attacks with his horn as the third attempts to rout us, utilizing the second door as a flanking maneuver. After the encounter, we pause and take in the room. Soaked in gore, it holds a single book on a pedestal in the middle, begging to be read. We see etched on the cover the title, The Book of Blood. Curiosity getting the better of us, it reads. And so, locked beyond the gateway of blood and past the hall of fire, valor awaits for the hero of light to awaken. Gateway of blood? Valor? Hero of light. All of these things make little sense, especially in a dark corner of a catacomb where no light shall pass. We portal back to town desperately in need of repairs and answers. Stopping a spell at the inn, we speak to Ogden, the tavern owner of this Valor, and he expounds. Son, every child hears the story of the warrior Arcane and his mystic armor known as Valor. If you could find its resting place, you would be well protected against the evil in the labyrinth. So this arcane and his armor known as Valor is a child's tale? It's then we seek the knowledge of the man most versed in armor, Griswold, the blacksmith, who shares. The armor known as Valor could be what tips the scales in your favor. I'll tell you that many have looked for it, including myself. Arcane hid it well, my friend. And it'll take more than a bit of luck to unlock the secrets that have kept it concealed all oh, law these many years. It's even eluded Griswold. With our sword repaired and a certainty the armor is buried somewhere, but hidden, we next question Cain, the elder's knowledge on the matter. Gateway of blood and the halls of fire are landmarks of mystic origin. Wherever this book you read from resides, it is surely a place of great power. Legends speak of a pedestal that is carved from obsidian stone and has a pool of boiling blood atop its bone-encrusted surface. There are also allusions to stones of blood that will open a door that guards an ancient treasure. The nature of this treasure is shrouded in speculation, my friend. But it is said that the ancient hero Arcane placed the holy armor Valor in a secret vault. Arcane was the first mortal to turn the tide of the Sin War and chase the legions of darkness back to the burning hells. Just before Arcane died, his armor was hidden away in a secret vault. It is said that when this holy armor is again needed, a hero will arise to don valor once more. Perhaps you are that hero. The Sin War? With this warrior Arcane's hand in turning the tide and his armor's namesake, Valor, we wonder if the angel of Valor, Imperius, had a hand in helping him. Speaking of heroes, we see Farnham the Drunk dozing by his favorite rock and try and prod him, to which he murmurs. <laughs> Pure Farnham, insightful and concise. Next, we speak to Pepin, the healer, about the tale. Hmm. It sounds like something I should remember, but I've been so busy learning new cures and creating better elixirs that I must have forgotten. Sorry. Well, in Pepin's defense, he mixes a mean brew. Running short on answers, we then speak to Wirt, the peg-legged grifter who scrutinizes. You intend to find the armor known as Valor? No one has ever figured out where Arcane stashed the stuff. And if my contacts couldn't find it, I seriously doubt you ever will either. Not impressed by the flunkies we imagine Wirt calls quote-unquote contacts, we keep it to ourselves and instead speak to Jillian the barmaid who shares. The story of the magic armor called Valor is something I often heard the boys talk about. You would better ask one of the men in the village. Well, we're all out of men, Jillian, but the next best thing is the witch they call Adria on the outskirts of town. 
Who warns? Should you find these stones of blood, use them carefully. The way is fraught with danger, and your only hope rests within your self-trust. We acknowledge the witch's words and recall everything that has been said. Prepare for danger, find bloodstones to place on an obsidian pedestal with a pool of blood on its top, no less, and pray this arcane is still on the side of light. Under the catacombs just northeast of the room in which we found the Book of Blood, we happen upon a fabled bloodstone on the ground in front of a great thorny podium. Doing as instructed, we place the stone atop the pillar and the blood boils upon contact with the stone when we hear a door nearby open. Following the sound, we head around the northwestern side of the room as we down a lone horror archer before cautiously entering a previously closed stone archway. Inside lay in wait two horned ones, again guarding a bloodstone on the ground. After hacking the knees from the demons, we pluck the bloodstone from amidst the carnage and head back to the obsidian pillar, which again bristles when it senses the stone nearby. A sound of another door opens, and this time to the northeast. Again, we contend with two horned demons and find the last of the bloodstones. Readying ourselves for what lay beyond the gateway of blood and inside, what Kane calls the Halls of Fire. Activating the bloodstone has the wall directly behind it fall away, revealing a long hall adorned by torches. A figure, who seems to be an apparition of a knight, stalks forward and we are sure this must be the revered Arcane re-risen. Not to be reasoned with, Arcane immediately casts a firewall, truly setting the hall ablaze and we retreat, realizing that no matter our intent, if we want the armor, we will have to earn it through an act of valor, which means battle. The Risen Arcane showing no sign of slowing, and he boxes us in with fire anytime we try and retreat, pushing us to stand our ground and fight for our right to wear this sacred panoply. Arcane, however, refuses to fall easily, healing through our onslaught as we greedily gulp potions to match him blow for blow. Yet somehow, as if bolstered by the light itself, we emerge victorious and cut the Reverism Warrior down. <laughs> May the spirit of Arcane protect me. On his body, we find 542 gold, a yellow robe, and coveted chainmail and buckler. We then head back to the Hall of Fire and see the sarcophagus Arcane rested in was ajar, showing he truly rose again to test our worth. Now, it should be noted, although the fight versus a mirror of our future self in the arcane armor was fitting, was not actually present in the original game. There was no arcane, but it lends itself enough to the storytelling without world, world breaking that I felt compelled to use the HD mod versus just pick up the armor off the ground, which happens in the game once you get the three bloodstones. May the spirit of arcane protect me. With that said, we race back to Kane, who identifies the armor as the fabled Arcane's Valor, which imparts plus 10 to vitality, armor class 25, plus 40 faster hit recovery, and minus 3 damage taken from enemies. Truly, it is a boon for the light, and we pray Arcane rests well. Thankful for the bounty the light has bestowed upon us, but like all good things, nothing worthwhile is given freely. On the sixth level of the catacombs below the town of Tristram, we find a mythical book surrounded by candles that reads, Beyond the Hall of Heroes lies the Chamber of Bone. Eternal death awaits any who would seek to steal the treasures secured within this room. So speaks the Lord of Terror, and so it is written. After which the wall behind the book disappears as if an illusion is lifted. In the middle of the room lies a great stone staircase, heading up into an unknown cavity in the ceiling. We have been warned by the book's passage, this is no doubt a treasure room, well hidden 
by the Lord of Terror and his minions. Unwilling to ascend the stairs unaided, we seek the knowledge of the townspeople to see if they know if testing the fates and promised eternal death is even worth the supposed treasure that lay therein. Back in town, we seek Adria the Witch by her hut, who is knowledgeable of demons and warns. You will become an eternal servant of the Dark Lords should you perish within this cursed domain. Enter the Chamber of Bone at your own peril. Well, we can't imagine what kind of treasure is worth our soul, or how many poor souls are now servants to the burning hells. Speaking of those touched by the evils below the cathedral, we speak to Farnham, the drunk who rants. Okay, so listen. There's this chamber of wood, see? And his wife, you know, her, tells the tree, because she got away. Then I says that might work against him, but if you think I'm gonna pay for this, you, uh, yeah. Chamber of wood. Make this happen, Blizzard. Next, we see Pepin the healer who cautions. This sounds like a very dangerous place. If you venture there, please take great care. Although his advice almost sounds patronizing, we realize it's only because Pep hasn't witnessed the horrors below the cathedral firsthand. Speaking of patronizing, there's this little boy named Wirt with a peg leg. It's made of wood, see, and uh, yeah. A vast and mysterious treasure, you say? Mm, maybe I could be interested in picking up a few things from you. Or better yet, don't you need some rare and expensive supplies to get you through this ordeal? He has a point. Chopping demons is expensive. Next, Jillian the barmaid confesses. I'm afraid that I haven't heard anything about that. Perhaps Kane the storyteller could be of some help. We don't expect a barmaid to know the secrets etched in the bowels of the catacombs, and Ogden the innkeeper relates a similar gap in knowledge. I'm afraid that I don't know anything about that good master. Cain has many books that may be of some help. Before we do see Cain the Elder, we try our hand for a last time with Griswold the blacksmith, but again, he comes up empty-handed. Ach no, nothing in this place. But you may try asking Cain. He talks about many things, and it would not surprise me if he had some answers to your question. It seems the devil knows how to keep a secret. So we seek out the wisdom of the Elder Deckard Cain by his well, and he recalls. A book that speaks of a chamber of human bones? Well, a chamber of bone is mentioned in certain archaic writings that I studied in the libraries of the East. These tomes inferred that when the lords of the underworld desired to protect great treasures, they would create domains where those who died in the attempt to steal that treasure would be forever bound to defend it. A twisted, but strangely fitting, end. It is kind of fitting. Treasure hunters that perish in this chamber of bone are cursed to defend it. But how many were selfish, and how many were trying to weaken the forces of hell? Only a fool would steal from the great evils themselves, willingly. Realizing our place now is perhaps that fool, we can at least set some poor souls free from this chamber of bone and eternal damnation. Back below the catacombs, we head up the stairs and inside the chamber of bone. As we enter, we round the first stone wall and are immediately confronted by a gaggle of cold death skeletons and their unseen allies. The herd encircles us, stabbing and bashing from all angles with the fervor of a subordinate that lives in constant fear of the wrath of a displeased master. Once the skeletons fall, the hidden appear and try their hand at defending the treasure. Although we realize we need to somehow contend with them one by one, their group attack persists from all sides, but to no avail. Ankle deep in bones and blood, we see a figure moving in the shadows, and as we attempt to trudge forward, we're rushed by a horned demon. Diablo is taking no chances with his trove. The demon felled, and moving into the hall, we're confronted by another unseen and horned demon, in front of an entrance that's clearly well guarded. Not enough mana. <sighs> Instead of opening it, we try to investigate and move up the west side, contending with errant skeletons by crucifixes set ablaze in unholy fire 
that never seems to dim or need fuel. In the light of the cross, we're rushed by several horned demons at once. Their manic movements that end our trespassing fails, but the intensity of their attacks is felt all the same. Above, we find a skeletal lever that opens a door on the east side, and as we move past the cross, its unholy fire licks at our oblique. As if to remind, the fury of Diablo's hate burns like unholy fire. On the east side, we find another similar lever that opens a door to our right, and a half score of skeletons start to shuffle out. We push our shield high and bar the doorway, lest we're overwhelmed. Heavily fatigued and remembering an old tale that undead fear holy bolts, we begin casting our paltry spells in succession, and they happen to be super effective but our mirth doesn't last. As we are not magically inclined, our mana stores are depleted quickly, and we rely again on our tiring sword arm. Not enough mana. Clearing the room of skeletons and sneaky unseen, we see a brown chest begging to be plundered. Remarkably, it bears no traps and is full of gold, armor, and weapons. A boon to be sure, but we realize this is too easy. Trinkets and gold alone aren't worthy of Diablo's vanity. Sensing that the main route that we passed holds something more valuable and no doubt more deadly. We open the door of the main room to reveal at least 30 undead skeletons staring blankly at us. Are these the fallen treasure hunters who dared cross Diablo? They rush us at the door opening, and as we try to force them back into single file, they push us out more as we slaughter enough just in time to dig our heels into the doorframe and go to work. Again, we attempt to leverage our learned Holy Bolt spell, but it thirstily depletes our mana, and we exclaim, Not enough mana. As we contend with the skeletons one by one, a hidden lurks from our flank to the right, trying to break our rhythm so the skeleton fiends can pour out of the opening. Feeling we have the upper hand, we step into the room to see the floor of the chamber is literally comprised of the bones of the fallen, hence its grisly namesake. After finally felling the foes, we begin to pick up the treasure littered about and pause momentarily to see a staff of Holy Bolt had dropped behind us early in the fight, almost mockingly. Feeling deflated that we missed it, we try and pick it up but are out of room in our inventory as more enemies pour in to finish the job. I have no room. We successfully clear the room and now can explore the northern section. And as we cross the door, we spot a truant hidden. But as we turn to face it, we're charged by a horned demon who hits us square in the back. A, a blow that would have no doubt killed us, save for Valor's armor protecting our hide. Another huge demon rushes at us, but we are not caught unaware this time and sidestep at the last second. The super unique Ormlos the Impala goes crashing into the bone wall, swiping at us as we pass. We frantically look for a better ground to fight without more horned ones rushing us from unseen angles. Hiding behind a pillar, we frantically attempt to fix our shield. However, we cannot repair our sword in time as Ormless hunts us down and we spring out from behind the pillar using our cleave ability. Ormlos, content to stand its ground, uses its horn in a digging motion upward. Unfortunately, our sword catches a notch at the base of the horn and breaks in hand, and we're left swinging our shield wildly. Desperate, we dive through a town portal to recover and regain our bearings. Back in town, we sell all the trinkets and weapons found in the chamber, knowing the only thing that matters is our armor and our own weapons intact, and the grace of the heavens to give us strength just not holy magic, unfortunately. Broken blade in hand, Griswold, clucking his tongue as he eyes us coming, says cheerily, Whoa, what can I do for you? Once repaired and restocked on our potions, we don't worry too much about mana and get ready to go to work the only way we know how. Through the portal, Ormlos awaits. We hear other enemies milling about and move quickly. 
managing to eliminate him just in time and picking up a tidy 600 gold off his corpse before his allies can rout us. We contend with the last of the demons and finally lay our hands on the staff of Holy Bolt, only to be rushed by another horned demon catching us unaware. Though quelling the assault, we can't help but think, can we ever catch a break in this place? Every single piece of loot here is either cursed or has some kind of catch. We seem to either be too late or a dollar short with our magics, and our own gear disintegrates rapidly after using it to get at a promised diabolical treasure. Still, we press on with the promise that there is a reward waiting at the end. In the barely lit northernmost room, it is all but quiet. There's no treasure chest or enemies in sight, save a lone book on a pedestal called the Ancient Tome. We cautiously read aloud the words and a three-headed hydra springs forth. Reading ourselves, we realize it doesn't attack us and we feel arcane energy gained somehow by reading the book. Heading back out of the room, we realize this is the promised treasure and fill our mana stores excitedly, now with a supernatural ally at hand, and begin to cast the Guardian spell and... Not enough mana. Of course, the gift we received for our ordeal was beyond our grasp, just like everything in that accursed chamber. As if we hear Diablo himself laughing at our misfortune. We vow to never return to the Chamber of Bone or any promised treasure of a prime evil, and will always remember the quote, All that glitters is not gold. On the seventh level of the catacombs below Tristram, we're overwhelmed by skeletal crimson archers and a bevy of goatmen to aid them. Slogging our way through the pack, we managed to dodge their leader once, then rammed by a second charge, and face then red unique Khazra, Blightful and Steel Mace, before we managed to fell the foul foe. Above its corpse, we spy a blue book surrounded by a pentagon of candles. On the cover, we see etched the title Book of the Blind, and it reads, I can see what you see not, vision milky then eyes rot. When you turn, they will be gone, whispering their hidden song. Then you see what cannot be, shadows move where light should be. Out of darkness, out of mind? cast down into the halls of the blind. We can't see, but instead hear a door unlock close by and realize this isn't just a poem, but a location. Weary of the promise of the darkness to come, we portal back to town for advice on what to make of this hall of the blind. By the outskirts of town, we make our way to the witch Adria's shack and she cautions. This is a place of great anguish and terror, and so serves its master well. Tread carefully, or you may yourself be staying much longer than you had anticipated. It sounds to be almost a prison for unfortunate souls. Speaking of unfortunate and blind, we then see the drunk Farnham, who points to us as we approach and laughs. Look here. <laughs> That's pretty funny, huh? Get it? Blind? Look here! <laughs> we do smile at his jest and are happy he is topside making puns and not locked in the horrible halls below. Although a long shot, we had heard that Jillian the barmaid's own grandmother had suffered from blindness and asked her for any clues, and she says, If you have questions about blindness, you should talk to Pepin. I know that he gave my grandmother a potion that helped clear her vision, so maybe he can help you too. <sighs> ah, Pepin, of course. Hopefully, we do not require said potion in the near future. The scanter thing that scares us, bar being locked in the catacombs below, blind and helpless. It's then we see Pepin the healer, and he recalls. This does seem familiar somehow. I seem to recall reading something very much like that poem while researching the history of demonic afflictions. 
It spoke of a place of great evil that... Wait, you're not going there, are you? Unfortunately, Pep, we are. And it seems that this is not a medical affliction, but demonic in nature. Perhaps too vexing for the healing hands of a local physician. We then see the one who was themselves injured by demons. Worth the peg-legged boy. And he scoffs. Let's see, am I selling you something? No. Are you giving me money to tell you about this? No. Are you now leaving and going to talk to the storyteller who lives for this kind of thing? Yes. Let's see. <laughs> Everyone's a comedian with the side jokes. We take Wirt's leave and head towards the Elder's Well in the middle of town, but stop by Griswold the Blacksmith's Forge, and he pauses to guide. I'm afraid that I've neither heard nor seen a place that matches your vivid description, my friend. Perhaps Kane the Storyteller could be of some help. Hopefully, we can gather some grounded insight from the town storyteller, Kane the Elder, who instructs. You recite an interesting rhyme written in a style that reminds me of other works. Let me think now. What was it? Darkness shrouds the hidden, eyes glowing unseen, with only the sounds of razor claws briefly scraping to torment those poor souls who have been made sightless for all eternity. The prison for those so damned is named... The Halls of the Blind. The Hidden? Oh, so it is a prison for the damned. Nothing seems more terrifying than an eternity of blind torment, but it is a fitting place of damnation for the Lord of Terror. Heading out of town, we then pause momentarily at Ogden the Tavern Keeper's Inn, and he reminisces. I never much cared for poetry. Occasionally I had calls to hire minstrels when the inn was doing well, but that seems like such a long time ago now. What? Uh, oh, yes, uh, well, I suppose you could see what someone else knows. You could see what someone knows? Not if you visited where we're going, Ogden, old boy. And thank the heavens, you aren't. Back down in the catacombs beneath the town, we move to the entrance of the Hall of the Blind, only to be met by crimson skeletons intercepting our path. Focusing on the bony foes, we are then attacked from behind by an unseen hidden in the doorway. As more skeletons appear, so do the unseen trickle in from behind in an attempt to route our entry. Moving inside this square hall, we can barely see as there is no light present, feeling our way into a smaller square room filled with unseen hidden lying in wait. We realize we've been trapped in the room as their kin appear behind us in a group scratching and clawing at us as we are forced to fight our way out. Now, extra cautious, we remember the unseen are a variant of the hidden and have heard tales of them being called the quote, boogeymen that haunt the dreams and live in the nightmares of children, although they dwell at the edge of the physical and ethereal realms where they remain unseen by mortal eyes, they can quickly manifest and strike those that appear vulnerable. Formerly known as Metis, Occultus, and others of their ilk feed upon the essence of fear. When wounded, they will still seek to retreat back into the ether to heal themselves. Although, thankfully for us, they still can be affected by spells and weapons when they appear in the physical realm. As we move in the hall north, we are again assaulted by an appearing unique haze shifter. Grey in colour and less visible than its counterparts, we realise we need aid in tracking the foe as it disappears to and fro. Stronger in magics than before, we cast the Guardian spell and a three-headed Hydra bursts forth from the ground to aid us, illuminating the demon that we cannot see as we drive our blade deep into its bloated torso. <sighs> Dead and in a heap, on Hayshifter's corpse, we bend down and gather up from the dark earth a rare, unique amulet that seems to shine and glisten in the dark. The hall's now cleared and our quest ended. We pause and realize the hall is in the shape of a small infinity symbol, as if wicked magic had disoriented the blind and they were doomed to scratch the way around a small, never-ending loop in anguish for eternity. 
So then we portal back to town with a renewed gratitude for our sight. The halls below have taught us how inventive the Lord of Terror is and the unsaid promise of the suffering the remaining townsfolk will endure if the evil below is left unchecked. We then see Kane the Elder to identify Hay Shifter's glimmering amulet, and ironically, it grants plus five to magic, resist lightning 20%, minus one damage taken from enemies, and plus 20% to light radius, as if the creature secretly coveted the light, which it forcibly forsook. We then look to the heavens, grateful for the light's touch and our new illuminating necklace that will no doubt guide our path down in the bowels of the catacombs below. On the eighth level of the catacombs below Tristram, we continue our hunt for the evil behind the town's woes. Peppered with arrows casually slung by fire clan archers, we stalk and put down their leader, Chaos Maul. After which, we begin hunting down the errant goatmen about and their winged familiars. It's then we see a curious sight, a magma demon so far from a lava source. Magma demons are said to be wicked, golem-like creatures that dwell in the subterranean caverns beneath Tristram. They usually appear in groups near lava rivers or pools, and according to ancient lore, magma demons came into being by the spilling of the greater evil Mephisto's blood in the burning hells, which means we must be getting close. Just south of the goat men's trap, we see a large rectangular room adorned with scrolls and a bookshelf guarded by a single blood golem. Shattering the stone behemoth, we head inside the library and are confronted by an unexpected turn of events. On the right side of the room, we see a unique counselor mage. Zar the Mad, enthralled in some form of research. Distracted, he notices us, but does not attack, and instead, he irritably states, What? Why are you here? All these interruptions are enough to make one insane. <laughs> here, take this and leave me to my work. Trouble me no more. We stand in disbelief, yet curious, not knowing what to expect, and look around this room of research at what his work is and if it poses a direct danger to the townspeople above. Seeing no sign of clues, we move towards Zar threateningly, but his state of madness seems to render him little more than bemused at our attempt at intimidation. As his gaze turns towards his bookcase, we realize he doesn't care about heaven or hell, but whatever power he believes he can glean from the old tomes. We gingerly reach into the case and uh, your curiosity will be the death of you. <laughs> Zar's passive facade drops and he teleports to and fro around the room. We strike him, but he repels us with a flash spell and begins slinging fireballs at us from range. It's then we corner the mad wizard in the northeast side of the room, but again, he aggressively casts flash to deter our assault. Now teleporting more erratically to and fro, he blips to the door of the room before making a mad dash for the hall. Realizing if left unchecked, he will no doubt bump into a large gathering of demons and slip our grasp, or perhaps overwhelm us. We frantically chase the wizard down the halls until he finally pauses below a bloody pentagram etched on the wall behind his library. It's there we shove our blade into his midsection before he can vanish once more. We say, Not enough crime saw you. Did I break your concentration? Zar, now a pile of ash, bar his items and leaves us gold, a healing potion, and a powerful staff of stone curse. Perhaps a stone curse will aid us into slowing enemies and stop their own vanishing act. What we do know now is what to expect when confronted by unholy teleporting mages that have allied themselves with the Dark Lords of Hell. <laughs> 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 
Once the player has entered the level 8 catacombs, search for three spell tomes to read in order of North, East, West. In Spiritu Sanctum, Predictum, Otium, Officio, Obitus, Ut Inimicus. A path opens up, and upon reading the arcane tome, it divulges. Let this tome serve as your warning. This is a forbidden place. Return from whence you came and your life will be spared. Horizon, master of the disciplines that summon and bind creatures to this plane, promises death to those who pass beyond the five pillars. You have been admonished. Thoroughly admonished, we start heading back to town for more clues before we approach the unholy pillars and learn what we can first from Ogden, the tavern owner, who says, You sound like dark creatures indeed. I am ignorant in matters of this nature, but I would assume that our storyteller may know of such legends. Ogden, although open with his own ignorance, gives us our first lead. The town scholar, Deckard Kane, for more clues. Approaching him, he says, So, you seek knowledge concerning the wars of hell, do you? Cryptic tomes speak of great battles that determine which of the demonic lords are to rule over hell. They also mention a bitter rivalry between two of these lords, Osmodon, who led the horned death against the armies of light, and Belial, known as the Lord of Lies. Their hatred of each other is eternal. The reasons for their loathing lost even to themselves. Tales abound that the mad wizard Horizon somehow trapped the lieutenants of these two lords of hell within his sanctum. There can be no more dangerous a path to tread than the one that falls alongside of demons. Should you also seek this path, watch your life and your soul very carefully, my friend. What an amazing tale to be cut from the game, as most players of Diablo 2 are intimately familiar with Horizon Sanctum. It's honestly amazing that not only is this referenced in the original Diablo, but also the deeper lore of Asmodan and Belial, which we are not fully privy to their machinations until Diablo 3. With that, we consult Griswold, the blacksmith, who has meandered on over mid-conversation and say, A bold tale indeed. My limited time beneath the cathedral leaves me purely equipped to offer you any help with this. But, as always, you'll find Cain well-versed in legends and folklore. It seems Horizon 2 is beyond Griswold's grasp. However, there is one man that surprises us, or lets us down completely, and rarely anything in between. So we head to Farnham, the town drunk, who says, Sounds like a good idea to me. You better get started right away. Okay, that's one for the letdown. Also, I am concerned that Farnham is sitting so close to the once infested cellar, but he seems content enough. So we head instead to the town healer, Pepin. Horizon was insane. There are forces with which one does not interfere. It would not surprise me if you found only the charred remains of this damn fool. It's true. Who would have the gall to take on not one? but two lesser evils and bound them to himself in any fashion drawing their ire to boot. Words to ponder as we head over to Wirt who says, The care and feeding of demons is definitely not an interest of mine. Here is a piece of friendly advice. If you get the chance, kill anything you see down there. Huh. Sage wisdom for a boy staring at a crack into hell itself. I wonder if Jillian too has any more insights or maybe her grandmother has seen a vision of this. This is something that is far beyond anything I have ever learned. I can only think of one person in all of Tristram who could help you. Cain, of course. She may be right. Cain is a font of knowledge, but when it comes to the dark arts, never dismiss Adria the Witch. So we head to her shack on the outskirts of town. 
You must destroy the two demons that Horizon has trapped within his sanctum at all costs. Should they escape from their imprisonment, they will create a link to this world that will make what lies below the cathedral seem like a children's tale. Imperius's holy spear, demons more powerful than what lies beneath the cathedral? What kind of man believes he can bind demons of that nature for any amount of time? We heed Adria's advice and make haste to the entrance of Horizon's sanctum. This is a place of great power. Inside the sanctum, the warrior Adrian remarks that it is a place of great power. And we get this unsettling feeling we're unwanted guests in this realm. A place that feels detached from our own time and space. We head south over the blood smear and try the first telepad to no avail. It's then we are met by nasty night clan archers and red death that attack us. Realizing the distance puts us at a severe disadvantage due to spells cast by traps and the ranged attacks of our foes, we encounter the first unique cold enchanted red death as we slog through the maze of the sanctum. Although Firewall disperses the Night Clan very nicely, we find little solace in the fact that this is a sorcerer's den, best built for ranged attacks. To the south, we happen upon an inner sanctum of sorts, guarded by Night Clan, traps, and tomes guarded by the mage Simonensis, the charlatan. After dropping the poison-infused fiend, we pilfer his short staff of flash and the tomes, reading the Tome of Knowledge which says, Then by binding the spirit to the crafted rock, it is given life. This sounds like a spell of some kind. And gifts us with arcane knowledge. We then head into the room next to us, one of which reveals the Creature of Flame Tome. Upon reading it, it says, The Creature of Flame by Horizon. Should be interesting reading. Unfortunately, this was a non-fiction tale, and a Creature of Flame pounces forth to assault us. Surviving the encounter, we venture onto a room just yonder where Horizon's journal lies. This looks like some sort of journal. It seems that I may have brought something to this plane that even I cannot control. The creature that fell into my astral trap is a very deadly demon. I have been able to bind it at the bottom of a pit, but it kills everything that I have sent there in attempts to defeat it. While it cannot escape, it does block the tunnels that lead to my protected haven. I am tempted to use the switch to open the tunnels to see if it will just leave, but I fear it is smarter than most of the lesser demons I have trapped before. If I could just lure it somewhere else. Here it is clear. Horizon is in over his head, having trapped a greater demon in his pit and unable to control it anymore. And it's also, unfortunately, our only path forward. Entering the pit, it seems like another layer of the cathedral, though this belies its true nature, no doubt. Also, as it's out of time and space, full of nightkin and guardian mudmen, it feels akin to a maze in which a minotaur waits of Greek legend of yore. After unlocking switches on both sides, it seems the main room opens to us and surprises us with the demon Doomlock, no doubt that one of the devils Horizon spoke of. It sets upon us with a vicious assault, only to teleport to and fro. Upon sending it back to the void, Aiden utters one word. Aye. Heading south and leaving no witnesses, we destroy the rest of the mud men and their foul night kin brethren, before teleporting out of the pit and seemingly back into the sanctum. Reading the Circle of Binding Tome, we learn of Belial's own lieutenant, Grimspike, and how to summon him. 
The Lieutenant of Belial is known as Grimspike. Beware this demon, for his strength appears immeasurable. Reading this scroll, and therefore speaking his name near an arcane circle of binding, will surely summon him there. Hmm. Near a circle of binding? It seems that if we read this book of names, Grimspike will appear. We cautiously open its pages and... Morta, Vespa, Gaia, Inumino, Evagin, Jatan, Lua, Gretan. Grimspike explodes with a ball of flame. He's knocked back and flames viciously lick at us, and his assault is something we can barely stand. In a last ditch effort, we use the insanity spell, which grants us a small window and burst of power at the cost of being heavily vulnerable when it wears off momentarily. Hitting Grim Spike with Cleave, we destroy one of Belial's best and a gifted an orange barbarian's belt recipe. But what's this? We're greeted by an unfamiliar summoner. Could this be the fabled Horizon in the flesh, here to thank us for our help of ridding his sanctum of these demons? As we approach Horizon upon contact, he immediately becomes hostile. <laughs> <laughs> The ungrateful Horizon with a mocking laugh, which I might add he maintains for the duration of the battle, starts exuding rings of fire, opening portals to hell with sickening sounds and delighting in the demons that pour forth. Our disadvantage of distance is heavily punctuated mockingly by the fact he is teleporting to and fro further and further sending unholy packs of fiends at us. We desperately call forth blasts of lightning, trying to overcome the demons and remember lessons learned previously. And instead of focusing on the demons, we turn all of our attention to Horizon himself. As he falls, laughing at us, even in a skeletal visage which hangs momentarily, still getting his last laugh mocking us in death before finally dissipating. With only standard loot around, it was actually Sebenesis who gave us the best reward save all of the spell tomes and books which would have been a phenomenal boom for any sorcerer. The staff that we acquired was named Glean Song, which boasts plus 12 to magic, an unfortunate minus 8 to vitality, regenerates mana 3 per 5 seconds, hit steals 3% mana, plus 4% to spell power, and 27% damage absorbed by mana. A bit of a glass cannon special with a nice twist with the mana absorption. But what did you think of seeing Horizon for the first time in the flesh? Do you rate the quest and think it's a missed opportunity, or best left to leave him as a mystery and only explore his sanctuary? in Diablo 2. After battling our way through the catacombs beneath town, we descend deeper into the ninth level to reveal caves bubbling with rivers of lava and are taken aback by the searing heat. It's hot down here. Just west of the cave's entrance, we find a curious sight on the ground, a patch of black mushrooms and remark. I can't use this yet. Having no use for the mushroom, we take note of it fighting hordes of hellstone golems flinging their hot magma. Ah! Hit with a nasty glob of lava, we about face to recuperate momentarily and happen upon a lone tome of ingredients and potions just lying in the midst of ash and dirt that reads, the fungal tome. Hmm. We wonder out loud what this could mean and head back to town to learn more about this moldy curiosity. Seeking out the witch Adria at the outskirts of town, we hope her knowledge of potions and brews comes in handy and she says, What do we have here? Interesting. It looks like a book of reagents. Keep your eyes open for a black mushroom. It should be fairly large and easy to identify. If you find it, bring it to me, won't you? We 
pause for a moment and reflect on the mushroom patch we just encountered, but she reiterates. It's a big black mushroom that I need. Now run off and get it for me so that I can use it for a special concoction that I am working on. Agreeing to help, we then seek out more information and see Farnham the drunk and query if he'd seen any big black mushrooms. And he imparts. Ogden Mitz is a mean black mushroom. But I get sick if I drink that. Listen, listen, here's the secret. Moderation is the key. They say that those who can't do, teach. But that does sound like a spicy brew. We next seek out the sage wisdom of the elder Deckard Cain by his well, who muses. The witch Adria seeks a black mushroom? I know as much about black mushrooms as I do about red herrings. Perhaps... Pepin the healer could tell you more, but this is something that cannot be found in any of my stories or books. Ah, that makes sense, the healer. We then turn to see Pepin out front of his hut about potential insight on the ingredient and... What ails you, my friend? Nothing. Wait, Cain just mentioned red herrings. I guess he knew Pepin wouldn't know anything about this. What a cheeky misdirect from the wily old man. We then speak to Griswold the blacksmith and he exaggeratedly states, If Adria doesn't have one of these, oh, you can bet that's a rare thing indeed. I can offer you no more help than that. But it sounds like a, oh, a huge gargantuan swollen, bloated mushroom. Well, good hunting, I suppose. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, Chris, settle down. Next, we speak to Ogden, the innkeeper, about his supposed black shroom brew Farnham spoke of, but he rebukes. Let me just say this. Both Garda and I would never, ever serve black mushrooms to our honored guests. If Adria wants some mushrooms in her stew, then that is her business. But I can't help you find any. Black mushrooms. Disgusting. Acting as if caught by a health inspector, we can't help but wonder, what the hell did Farnham drink? Next, we ask Gillian the barmaid if she had seen this supposed brew, and she admits. I think Ogden might have some mushrooms in the storage cellar. Why don't you ask him? You know, I'm starting to think it was a failed experiment of Ogden's that he only used on Farnham. Next, we seek out Wirt the peg-legged boy, Maybe he has some shrooms in his inventory, but he counters. I don't have any mushrooms of any size or color for sale. How about something a bit more useful? With that, we know one thing. We gotta keep our eyes out for one big mushroom. Back down in the caves, we're confronted by a pack of winged gargoyles, intermingling with hellstones, drawing upon the hot rock below. We'd heard of the gargoyles in ages past. It was customary to decorate buildings with the stone statues of demons that were enchanted to serve as guardians and protectors of those within. The misshapen figures of the statues were designed to taunt and anger any demons that attempted to gain entrance. It was Diablo himself that worked worked to unlock the wards that protected these granite images, and eventually was able to gild them with Hadean life. The gargoyles arose from their captive sleep and swooped down to prey upon those whom they were created to protect. Naturally, the remaining statues were immediately destroyed, but there were signum that escaped and continued to terrorize the innocent to this day. The act of transforming from flesh to stone allows the creatures to heal any wounds that it has suffered, so we can see it's best to either avoid these demons entirely or to hunt them down until they're dead. With that, we do our best not to allow them to flee, for they soon will return in full force, and heaven knows how many of these gargoyles have sought sanctuary down in these caves, now in the service of the Lord of Terror himself. Clearing the area, we then spy a familiar sight. A patch of black mushrooms near some slain golems, and with a particularly large mushroom in the middle, we heft it out of the ground and exclaim, Now that's one big mushroom. Racing back to Adria, mushroom in inventory, she excitedly eyes it, saying, 
Yes, this will be perfect for a brew that I am creating. By the way, the healer is looking for the brain of some demon or another so he can treat those who have been afflicted by their poisonous venom. I believe that he intends to make an elixir from it. If you help him find what he needs, please see if you can get a sample of the elixir for me. Demon's brain? Our quest has taken us from warrior to physician's assistant rather quickly. Nevertheless, we oblige the witch and meet Pepin in front of his infirmary, and he instructs. The witch told me that you were searching for the brain of a demon to assist me in creating my elixir. It should be of great value to the many who were injured by those foul beasts. If I can just unlock the secrets, I suspect that its alchemy holds. If you can remove the brain of a demon when you kill it, I would be grateful if you could bring it to me. Now, on a vital quest to aid the townsfolk, hoping to heal their wounds before grievous damage can befall them, like poor Wirt and his diseased leg. We return once more to the caves below, in hunt of a big, fat, juicy demon brain for Pepin to dissect. On the tenth level of the caves, we're bombarded by magma balls, as bloodstones lob their fiery projectiles safely from behind wooden fencing. Forcing us to open the fence, we let out bulky frost charges and kill the first in the doorway as its brethren amass to ram us with their deadly horns. Nearly overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of the pack, we reach into the gore of the bodies on the ground and extract a charger's brain and exclaim, Just what I was looking for. Realizing we best retreat with brain still intact, or lest we be swarmed, we back out of the lava-soaked den and portal back to town once more. Racing to Adria the witch with the brain tucked under her arm, she scolds. Why have you brought that here? I have no need for a demon's brain at this time. I do need some of the elixir that the healer is working on. He needs that grotesque organ that you are holding. And then bring me the elixir. Simple when you think about it, isn't it? Realizing our error, we make haste to the healer's hut and Pepin says. Excellent. This is just what I had in mind. I was able to finish the elixir without this, but it can't hurt to have this to study. Would you please carry this to the witch? I believe that she is expecting it. We do now have two distinct choices in this quest. If we decide to selfishly drink the elixir, Adria will not say a word to us upon our return and the quest ends. I sense a soul in search of answers. If otherwise we collect the elixir from Pepin and give it to Adria, she again scolds. What? Now you bring me that elixir from the healer? Oh, I was able to finish my brew without it. Why don't you just keep it? With that, we can drink the elixir. In either scenario, we gain plus three to all attributes, indeed making it a powerful brew. No doubt, Farnham would love to get his hands on. And the town is safer once more, but it's also a reminder that aiding others, no matter how seemingly insignificant, can potentially bear powerful fruits or mushrooms, as it were. It should be noted, upon finding the girthy mushroom, the warrior seems to have several cut lines of dialogue which vary in humor levels, such as, That's not such a big mushroom. I've never seen a mushroom that size. That mushroom's the size of a Cadillac. Damn, what a mushroom. What a <laughs> mushroom. Pelted by a hail of poison spitter acid, we return from the unrelenting demon attacks down below in the caves and back up to the town of Tristram once more. It's then we're beckoned by the town blacksmith, Griswold, who shares. Greetings! It's always a pleasure to see one of my best customers. I know that you've been venturing deeper into the labyrinth, and there's a story I was told that you may find worth the time to listen to. One of the men who returned from the labyrinth told me about a mystic anvil that he came across during his escape. His description reminded me of legends I had heard in my youth about the burning hellforge where powerful weapons of magic are crafted. The legend had it that deep within the hellforge rested the anvil of fury. This anvil contained within it the very essence of the demonic underworld. 
It is said that any weapon crafted upon the burning anvil is imbued with great power. If this anvil is indeed the anvil of fury, I may be able to make you a weapon capable of defeating even the darkest lord of hell. Find the anvil for me, and I'll get to work. A great anvil imbued with dark power? We see the barely contained lust for a dark lord ending artifact, such as the fabled anvil dancing in Griswold's eyes, but have seen ourselves the harsh reality of what promised demonic trinkets can impart. Especially a demonic anvil absconded would bring forth the full fury of hell itself. Somewhat reluctant, we seek out the other townsfolk for any information gleaned on this legendary anvil. Heading out to the resident demonologist, Adria the Witch by her hut, who tempts. There are many artifacts within the labyrinth that hold powers beyond the comprehension of mortals. Some of these hold fantastic power that can be used by either the light or the darkness. Securing the anvil from below could shift the course of the Sinwar towards the light. Somehow, we think to ourselves, the artifacts of hell are only meant to be wielded by demons alone. Pondering this, we then speak to Farnham, the town drunk. But as soon as we mention the anvil, he simply blurts out, Griswold can't sell his anvil. What will he do then? And I'd be angry too if someone took my anvil. I will make sure to send my sympathies to Griswold, old Farnham. Wait, it isn't Griswold's anvil. Whoever owns it is going to be furious if we take it. Somehow, as Farnham does, he's inadvertently helped us contemplate our plight cryptically, but a little bit more nonetheless. We then speak to the resident scholar, Deckard Kane, about the lore of such an anvil's legend, and he recalls, Griswold speaks of the Anvil of Fury, a legendary artifact long searched for, but never found. Crafted from the metallic bones of the razor pit demons, the Anvil of Fury was smelt around the skulls of the five most powerful magi of the underworld. Carved with runes of power and chaos, any weapon or armor forged upon this anvil will be immersed into the realm of chaos, embedding it with magical properties. It is said that the unpredictable nature of chaos makes it difficult to know what the outcome of this smithing will be. Realm of chaos. That sounds safe. A testament to just how desperate our plight has become. Heading to the infirmary next, we speak with Pepin the Healer, who says, If you had been looking for information on the Pestle of Curing or the Silver Chalice of Purification, I could have assisted you, my friend. However, in this matter, you would be better served to speak to either Griswold or Cain. Chalice of Purification, eh? Wouldn't mind finding that and giving Farnham a sip or two. We then speak to Wirt the Peg-Legged Boy about the Anvil, and perhaps in enhanced wares, but instead he rebukes. If you were to find this artifact for Griswold, it could put a serious damper on my business here. Ah, uh, you'll never find it. Who would have thought? Wirt doesn't appreciate fair trade. We then make our way to Jillian, the barmaid's house, and she remembers of the tale. Griswold's father used to tell some of us when we were growing up about a giant anvil that was used to make mighty weapons. He said that when a hammer was struck upon this anvil, the ground would shake with a great fury. Whenever the earth moves, I always remember that story. Ah, no wonder Griswold is so keen on the idea. It was his own father who regaled him with tales as a boy of the legendary anvil. Lastly, we see Ogden, the innkeeper, who helpfully states, Don't you think that Griswold would be a better person to ask about this? He's quite handy, you know. You don't say. Shaking off the feeling Ogden was just lightly patronising us, we instead take the innkeeper at his word and head back down to the caves in search of the famed Anvil of Fury. Down on level 10 of the caves, we are all but overwhelmed by crimson gargoyles, known as blood claws, 
golden vanishing illusion weavers and the vomitous poison spitters, regurgitating rank poison spat in torrents and sizzling underfoot as its toxins gnaw at our heels and burrows into our bloodstream. <laughs> We've heard horrific tales of these creatures before. It's said of the poison spitters, after an especially violent battle, Bale, the Lord of Destruction, would enjoy celebrating with his brothers by holding a feast of blood, human flesh, and other hellish delights. The Bestia Acerbus are the descendants of dog-like creatures that lived by feeding upon the remains of Bale's nightmarish feasts. The variety of vile substances that the creature consumed, along with their close proximity of the Lord of Destruction, twisted and warped the viscera of these hounds of hell. These quadrupedal creatures are scavengers, able to move with insidious agility, and their armoured backs are festooned with scales and ridges. Spitting terrors are capable of spitting up a variety of caustic fluids and projecting them from a considerable distance. Packs of these terrors are especially devastating, as their bile has been known to eat through the strongest of armor and poison the most hearty of men. They will move in on their prey that seems weak or crippled. Great care must be taken when within the lair of these bestia. Their venom retains its potency for a considerable amount of time, and puddles of it may be found everywhere. When killed, the beast's inner toxins eat through the now dead flesh, leaving a dangerous trap for those foolish enough to tread upon the corpse. After contending with the spitters one by one, we confront their leader, the unique Plague Wrath, which is cursed with a terrible flash bell when we near the red wretched beast. We then attempt to use magic such as fireball and chain lightning to counter its close quarter spells to little effect. Cornering the critter, we take the brunt of several flash spells as it falls in a heap of poison before collecting a yellow axe off its corpse. Heavily fatigued, we head back to town and see Griswold the blacksmith once more with an update about the anvil, but instead he just promises. Nothing yet, eh? Well, keep searching. A weapon forged upon the anvil could be your best hope, and I'm sure that I can make you one of legendary proportions. And so our search continues for the anvil. Restocked and resolved renewed as we venture into the caves once more. Clearing the caves, we happen upon a great cavernous expanse. In the middle bubbles a vast lake of lava, square in appearance, save a small peninsula in the middle. We make our way around the scorching magma and dispatch a lone blood claw that had watched us from its stony state. Seemingly empty, we see the Anvil of Fury itself, unguarded in the middle of the landmass. We race towards it then. I shall crush you! A vomitous, colored overlord demon, fittingly named the Smith, appears through a red portal, cleaver in hand as it swings wild in an attempt to defend its invaluable keepsake. We about face and I hacked with the cleaver itself, its horrible bite sinking into our armor, and if we didn't possess Arcane's valor, we surely would perish on the spot. The speed of the smith is unparalleled for its size, as its back is exposed, summoning the guardian spell, but again, to little avail. The smith, seeing our desperation already, possesses an air of assured victory in its wicked gaze, as it narrows our escape back to its coveted anvil on a lonely land mass. Push back to the peninsula and dangerously close to the edge of the lava, we know we only have one option lest our corpse is permanently submerged in the Red River. We weather the blows of the smith and retaliate with all the strength we can muster and yell, time to die. <laughs> The Overlord, momentarily stunned by our renewed courage, creates for us an opening and we hack at its bloated belly until it falls dead on the ground. Exhausted, we pant, picking up a unique cap and axe, and attempt to pick up the anvil itself, but are immediately dismayed at its girth, frustratedly exclaiming, Where would I put this? I can't carry anymore. We then make preparations to strap the anvil to our back and room in our inventory to do so and exclaim, I need to get this to Griswold. 
now lugging an entire anvil like a beast of burden. We portal back to town and see Griswold, who is astonished and says, Fuck, oh, I can hardly believe it. This is the Anvil of Fury. Good work, my friend. Now, we'll show those bastards that there are no weapons in hell more deadly than those made by men. Take this, and may light protect you. Griswold, wasting no time, starts to use his forge and the powers of hell and chaos to create a mighty broadsword that thrums with power, which he hands to us and calls it Griswold's Edge. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. We immediately take the weapon to Kane, who identifies its new chaos properties as 27% chance to hit, plus 65 enhanced damage, fire hit damage 1 to 10, plus 20% increased attack speed, plus 25% chance to knock back enemies, and to top it off, it's indestructible. Truly a boon for the light, as Griswold had remarked. And we then realize what better weapon to use against the enemy than their own. It should be noted that Griswold's Edge in Vanilla Diablo can be regarded as one of the most powerful unique swords in normal difficulty due to its many qualities, but this version is slightly different as this is the Beelzebub HD mod featuring cut content, such as the Smith Demon who was not present in Diablo 1 but appeared in Act 1 of Diablo 2. However, I feel that it adds a lot more depth to the quest, battling the Smith over his anvil versus just picking up the anvil guarded by some generic demons. Speaking of demons, it looks like, thanks to Griswold, we now have an invaluable edge. Once the player has entered level 11, if you approach Jillian the barmaid, she says, Beg pardon, but have you heard what has been happening? Some of the men have vanished from the village. Disa's sons, Aeneas and Ruth, claim to have seen strange lights glowing deep within the woods a few days ago, but no one has heard from them since. I too have seen a crimson shimmering from beyond the ash groves, but I've been too afraid to approach it. I fear that Ogden or our healer Pepin may be next. Won't you please find out what has happened? It's curious that somewhere in the forest near the village, out in the open, which we have never explored in the original Diablo game, are supposedly sinister crimson lights beyond some ash grove. And being reported by villagers, as not only Jillian mentions Dika and an unseen character, but also her sons Anias and Ruth, who undoubtedly didn't make it into the final cut of the game. We also have leads of whom Jillian fears for, as she remarked both Pepin the Healer and Ogden's safety may be in question. Though, as the forest is northwest of the town, one can only assume that Wirt himself would be easy pickings, but we shall check on him later, even if Jillian does not. Heading to Ogden to learn more of this curious phenomena, he says, Greetings, good master. Welcome to the Tavern of the Rising Sun. Jillian has been going on and on about strange lights in the trees but I haven't been able to make heads nor tails of a story. I certainly haven't seen any strange lights, and if I did, they would be the least of my worries. Well, it seems the jittery innkeeper Ogden has just dismissed Jillian, perhaps weary of the onslaught of demons through the town, or maybe he doesn't think her claims hold much weight. In any case, before we see Pepin, we should pop around the corner to the most trustworthy of sources, Farnham, the drunk for his hot take on these mysterious lights. Time to fell drink in peace? <laughs> well, that was enlightening. I guess it's off to Pepin then. Roof and Aeneas are missing? Light protect us. Is there no place that is safe? Our only hope of returning to a peaceful life rests in you. Please. You must find those boys and bring them home to their family. Pepin fully embraces the gravity of this dire situation and urges us to find this Ruth and Anias. With little doubt that they are out in the grove, we seek the wisdom of Deckard Cain on the matter. While the barmaid may seem a bit confused at times, it is true that men have been disappearing from the village. 
It reminds me of ancient writings about a demonic temptress called Andariel. Known as the Maiden of Anguish, her thirst for mortal blood was so great that she sought to learn a spell to breach the mortal realm. By seducing one of the dark sorcerers of the netherworld, Andariel took the knowledge she needed and so began to lure mortal men into her dark corner of hell. If these legends are true, she is not a creature to be taken lightly. First off, it's amusing how dismissive, as Deckard refers to her offhand even as the barmaid. Second, and Dariel, the maiden of anguish herself. Instead, she appears to be more of a demonic succubi, first breaking the seal between the burning hells and the mortal realm, and second, seducing men as she thirsts for mortal blood. What a wretched creature she is if we are indeed to face her. Stealing our resolve, we head to Griswold, the blacksmith, to learn what the best way to put down a demonic temptress is with steel. I admit that I too have seen these strange lights, but I have not felt pulled towards them. I'll be sure to steer clear of them, and will tell everyone that visits here to do likewise. I'm unsure what to make of this. Is Griswold unfazed by the lights of a temptress due to his resolve? Is he bewitched or is he unaffected by the fairer sex? Could be a telling character moment, but it's not really our focus. Instead, we decide to commiserate with one well-versed in the dark arts and feminine wiles about 40 years ago. So we speak to Adria the Witch. The succubus is a demon that feasts upon the essence of mortal men. You will find that Andariel has quite an appetite. The town will soon be devoid of any adult males unless you stop her feeding now. Unbelievable. Andariel in her current incarnation, much like Lilith, is a succubi feeding on males. No wonder some of the men seem addled and dismissive. Maybe her spell clouds their vision. But one thing is for certain, if hell pouring forth into Tristram isn't enough, so too is the Maiden of Anguish and her minions luring what's left of the able-bodied male stragglers out of town. And she must be stopped at all costs, but not before we quickly talk to a beguiled boy, Wirt, who himself is smitten by Jillian the barmaid, but probably not of age to be lured into the forest. You know, I've been looking for those lights, but I can't find them. If Jillian says they are there, I believe her, but I have yet to see them for myself. It's confirmed Wirt cannot see the lights. This is very interesting. It seems he really mustn't be of age. With that, we head north out of town, and the mod itself has slightly moved things around with the caves in place. However, what looks like a second opening to hell appears north of Wirt's old tree and leads us to the underground passage. Remarkably, this is the first open dungeon in Diablo 1. One can only guess why it was cut from the final game, though it makes sense why the developers may have some trepidation about adding a new landscape to the final game and the resources it would take. However, I am in awe of how the Beelzebub mod team have made sure to keep Diablo 1's atmosphere intact with a lower view draw distance to make sure you don't feel like you're an adventurer slogging through the dreary fields near the rogue encampment of Diablo 2, but instead the horror tone of Diablo 1 remains fully intact. As we investigate the forest, we spy the strange red lights described by the townsfolk and a plethora of demons. Notably, frost chargers who rush us, spitters making things tough thanks to the new rivers between us to contend with, and the ever-wretched Dusk Clan Goatmen looking for any opportunity to drop us where we stand of which some uniques appear between them, as Seth the Ripper Hunter, who drops a yellow amulet and is extra strong, and Gut Dancer the Dark, who is a spitter with a nasty acid and in turn drops a yellow cape. With a pause in combat to collect ourselves, curiosity gets the better of us, or perhaps the lure of the succubi, and we investigate the light a little too closely, in which we are cursed with lessened magical resistances for 40 seconds. 
as we are softly illuminated by the crimson light, checking decapitated corpses one by one for the Lost Boys, with the restless, ever-watching eyes of demons just over the river. With that, a charger explodes out of a cave rushing us, named Glory Horn, the Boner. While the fright was quite the addition gameplay-wise, the name was a little immersion-breaking and I doubt it was in the original, at least 50% sure as it was the 90s and it was a bunch of young dude programmers. Heading northwest, we are hit with a barrage of unfamiliar spells. It seems a torrent of blood stars pour our way, and we're forced to back up and collect ourselves. Stealing our resolve, we head back towards the source and are peppered with unavoidable yellow missiles by none other than the Maiden of Anguish herself. Surrounded by a myriad of dead men strewn about in a mocking fashion, naked, hanging, and bloody corpses defile the land, and a cauldron sits near. As a warrior and decently leveled, we only have one option, to hack at Endaria with our cleave ability and hope our armor and potions hold out. After a grueling battle, the foul demon is finally felled. You lure no more men to their deaths. Aiden triumphantly remarks that she shan't be luring poor men to their death anymore, and although she drops a fair amount of choice loot, I cannot think of the fate of the boys Anias and Ruth. Heading back to town, although usually there's no update when a quest is completed, Jillian thanks us for keeping the men of the village safe. But it's clear the boys, unfortunately, weren't so lucky. Demons that assume the form of beautiful women, you say? That's horrible! Thank the light that you solved this mystery before any more of our men were lured to their deaths. Thank you for keeping us safe from the powers of darkness once again. With that, we see Decked Cain to identify our bounty, among which Endariel drops the unique Maiden's Amulet, which boasts a whopping plus 5 to all attributes, plus 30 to fire resist, 2 mana regen per 5 seconds, and hit steals 3% mana. It's a great for a sorcerer, or any player for that matter, as skills are very thirsty for mana in the Beelzebub mod, which is linked in the description and made this quest possible, and it's just a great quality of life mod to add something to the game if you're looking to re-explore Diablo 1. An island where angels watched? Although Farnham's memory is often cloudy these days, that does seem familiar. Once the player has entered the caves or level 12, at this point, if you head back to town and approach Farnham, the drunk, he slurs. Hey, you there. Come here, listen up. You know about the island where angels watch? Pick the right rocks, but you better shield your eyes. Shield everything. I know, because I've been there and... Mm. Ale. We have... Several clues from Farnham about some island where angels watch and picking correct rocks? It all seems like gibberish and goes downhill quickly as he slips into an ale-filled fantasy midway. So, not completely writing off Farnham's tale of angels just yet, we head to Ogden, the tavern owner, to see if he overheard some more tangible information. You know, sometimes I wonder how much faith you can put into what Farnham says. He spends so much time reliving his memories of the labyrinth and just being plain drunk that he doesn't always make much sense. I guess you could ask around, though. Ogden, none the wiser than us, questions the validity of Farnham's claim, yet directs us to speak to the other townsfolk. So, we see the second best source of gossip in town, Jillian, the barmaid. Those are the words of a drunkard. I don't see how they could be true. Jillian heavily dismisses Farnham and makes us question whether or not his words are the addled ramblings of a drunken fool. So we try the wry wort for a change of pace. This is one time that you should listen to Farnham. I have heard of this place, and I know a few sorcerers who have tried to create a portal to get there. Ah... I'm glad we didn't write off Farnham prematurely. Apparently, this place is sought after by sorcerers and requires some form of portal. Interesting. We should stock up with Pep and the Healer and learn more if we can. For once, I can vouch for Farnham's extraordinary claim. 
There are many mentions in the books that I've been reading about a place of great healing where warriors of light would go to mend the wounds sustained in the Sin War. If you could find this place, it would most assuredly be to the benefit of us all. This is extraordinary. Warriors healed of wounds and, and from the infamous Sin War, no less, where a man expelled the forces of heaven and hell from sanctuary. With that, we speak to Griswold, who was conveniently eavesdropping, and say, Farnham speaks of a place that exists, at least in legend. Warriors would go to a place at the edge of hell to gird themselves for battle against the armies of darkness. If the stories are true, untold treasures could lay upon this island of the sunless sea. Wow. Portals, healing, the edge of hell, and now treasure? This place sounds remarkable, if it does indeed exist. There's no question in my mind we should seek out the town scholar, Deckard Kane and get his take on these events. So we approach the aging Kane standing by the well in the middle of town, and he says, Hmm, an island where angels watched? Although Farnham's memory is often cloudy these days, that does seem familiar. Perhaps the ancient chronicles of the Sin War can help us. Ah, yes, here is something. In a time long forgotten, a sea of blue rested on the edge of the fiery netherworld. This was an oasis for those who acted as the watchmen over the gates of hell. Angels and warriors of light could use this place to heal themselves and gather their strength. It was also a staging area where they could train and prepare for the Sin War. Legends speak of a trinity of rocks that hide the path to this island of the sunless sea. This tale gets more intriguing by the second, a staging ground for angels to hone their martial prowess against the burning hells. Now we know a portal is necessary for entry and that statues are the key. We best consult with Adria, the witch, before we attempt to breach this curious island. This legendary place is real, and great rewards await you should you find it. Nothing more can I say. Although Adria again confirms its existence, we are left with nothing more than a prompting to seek out this fabled island, and so we head back down to level 12 of the caves in search of the statues. In the caves, once more, we're set upon by spitters, and overlords are plenty until we find a curious room with four pressure pads. Although no clues are left for us to unlock them, so we head back to town quickly to hopefully be advised further by Farnham. <laughs> Farnham, just plum tuck it out, is indisposed due to our previous conversation and leaves us none the wiser on how to unlock our goal. So we must work on this puzzle ourselves. Through trial and error, we figure out that going from south, north, east, west, wait, it seems to stay in line with the devilish motif, the reverse of the Holy Cross. Legends speak of a trinity of rocks. As we step into this newly found area, it's quickly apparent something's wrong. Is this the fabled secret training area of angels said to heal wounded warriors and be full of treasures? It looks like a green, corrupted lava area with a single campfire for rest, but is it friendly or overrun by the burning legions? As we touch the first flame, it explodes in a flash and shows it is indeed, unfortunately, corrupted, spelling things to come. As we round the corner, we're met with an unfriendly pack of undead Balrogs hurling ice at us and their fire-belching brethren, the Guardians. As we are nearly overrun by both, hacking our way through packs and sub-bosses alike, we do find a handy spell of infravision to clear the way, and as we see more corrupted campfires, it becomes apparent we must extinguish them to aid in the cleansing of this once holy sanctuary. 
It's then we spy an angelic statue alone on an island, and we're flanked by a group of guardians with their sub-boss, Archon the Flayer, a poison-enchanted mini-boss. We fight our way through, face Archon, and collect a green ring from his corpse before heading back to the curious statue. Although when we touch the statue, nothing happens, we're left to our own devices to unlock it. And so, extinguishing the flames around the statue, a boss undead Balrog appears from it, named Samuel the Dead Speaker, who unleashes ghastly apparitions at us that track us down, summons guardians while spitting rings of acid, a terrible foe at lower levels, and he would have dropped us quickly where we stood. As such, we close the gap and focus him down, landing the killing blow which disintegrates this foul skeleton and his minions with it. <laughs> On screen, we see the taint has lifted and the waters return from Samuel's foul yellow taint to an angelic blue. As such, we head back to town to identify the bow we dropped, as well as the other loot we found too. The ring we found is a green set piece called Death's Grasp, which has resist all, plus 14%, damage taken from enemies, and two points to damage. The bow Samuel drops is called Bramble Song, which has a healthy, plus 47% chance to hit, plus 70% enhanced base damage, making it 5 to 17, 4 to 16 fire damage, and plus 23% chance to knock back. Truly a bow fit for an angel. We also found a handy yellow ring named Viper Band, with a huge plus 36% resist magic, plus 12 to strength, resin mana 3 per 5 seconds, which is also not a bad find. The island definitely lived up to its treasure boasting ways, although when we return to Farnham, he doesn't say any more and has seemingly forgotten about the quest already, as he is enjoying his ale. Can't a fellow drink in peace? Ah, oh, you speak of an ancient and evil weapon! Tread lightly in this area, for the legends of Shadowfang are as black as a moonless winter night. Crafted within the Hellforge, Shadowfang can rend the very soul from whoever it strikes. Ah, oh, I do not envy you if it is in your mind to defeat the one who wields it. May light protect you, brave hero. Pivotal to Flash Doom is also quest giver Tremaine the Priest. But who is Tremaine, you ask, and why have you likely not seen him either? Well, Tremaine was a character planned for Diablo 1 who does not appear in the final game for reasons unknown, but there are sound files of his speech in the game's main data file. All I can do now is pray for us all. He was supposed to travel in and out of Tristram and was to trigger the Flesh Doom, wielder of Shadowfang Quest, which which, as mentioned, also never made it into the game's final release. However, thanks to the Beelzebub mod bringing these files back to life, we can experience the quest close to as it was intended. If you head to level 13 of the Burning Hells, he can activate the Flesh Doom quest line, and approaching him, he says, I have had a most disturbing experience that I must share with you, my friend. Earlier today, I was called upon to help one of the men that escaped from the labyrinth. He was deranged, violent, and kept lashing out at all of those who tried to calm him. I suspected that he was possessed by some sort of demonic entity, and so began to drive the evil from within him. After many hours, I was able to exorcise a demon who called himself Flesh Doom, but the Hellion fled into the labyrinth. You may think that I am mad, but after speaking with the man and battling with Flesh Doom, I believe that the labyrinth has somehow become a gateway to the underworld. As you descend deeper, you may find yourself upon the doorstep of hell itself. Finally, the man who was possessed retained memories of an ancient demon blade named Shadowfang. If you find the demon Flesh Doom, beware this foul sword. While I fear the dangers below grow even greater, you must find Flesh Doom and slay him. Bring the sword to me and I can destroy it, but do not wield it. 
for its power can corrupt absolutely. Tremaine immediately displays his valor and utility in Tristram as a holy man, even able to exercise this flesh doom from a poor townsman. But as flesh doom has fled back to hell and it seems may still be in possession of the corrupt Shadowfang blade that consumes souls en masse, we are best to do as Tremaine says and bring the sword back to him post haste. Before we head down though, we should consult the wisdom of the townsfolk of Tristram. Greetings good master, welcome to the Tavern of the Rising Sun. I saw the exorcism. It was incredible how Tremaine drove the evil spirit from that man's wrecked and tortured body. I pray that something that horrific never happens to anyone here ever again. With that ghastly description, I cannot help think that what happened to the villager, so we had to pepin the healer for potential clues. But first, a quick stop for some of Farnham's sage advice. Can't a fellow drink in peace? You gonna hunt down a demon? Is that what you said? I know I didn't hear that, because nobody hunts down demons. Nope. Nobody. Farnham may be drowning in booze, but he's right to be in awe of the thought of demon hunters. What ails you, my friend? I was asked to assist in the exorcism. My skills were able to ease the poor man's suffering as Tremaine drove the demon from his body. While I was treating him for an exceptionally high fever, he spoke of a place of searing heat. The tortured fellow cried out about hell and falling into a pit of flame. I could not make any sense of it, and thankfully he soon recovered. Pepin too recalls a grisly tale of a man's exorcism, and it seems we are best to take to the burning hells once more, lest flesh doom attacks the townsfolk. Down on level 13, we are set upon by scores of flame-spitting berserker vortex lords and torrents of blood stars thanks to the resident succubi, all vying to take down the lone wanderer. It's then we hear an unfamiliar voice bark a threat of taking our soul. <laughs> this has to be the infamous flesh doom. It immediately becomes apparent with his vicious AoE casting, we are on the back foot and need to clear a path back to town. Flesh Doom takes chase and we turn to face him in a solo confrontation. After a long and arduous battle, his body is eviscerated and sent back to the abyss whence he came. And we spy among various items, Shadow Fang, to take back to Tremaine and finally be destroyed. However, as we attempt to pick it up, Aiden says, I don't want that. And it's clear we must seek Tremaine's advice once more on how to deal with and dispose of this cursed blade, as we cannot touch it. Flesh Doom's demise is a great good to the world, yet Shadow Fang remains. It must be found and destroyed. Do not attempt to use the Demon Blade, Champion. It will corrupt and madden any mortal who wields it. I alone can end its dark evil. With a grave warning, we are tasked with retrieving the blade for Tremaine alone to dispose of. However, I think it's prudent we learn more about the blade first, as surely some of the other townsfolk have heard of it. Heading to Word, he says, Psst, over here. I don't know who this flesh doom is, but I have heard rumors of an ebon blade that cleaves a soul from the body. Even I would not try to sell that thing, no matter what the profit. If you find it, you should do as Tremaine says and destroy it as quickly as possible. If even Wirt, the shifty grifter, is wary of the blade, one can only assume the worst. Speaking of the darker elements of Tristram, we venture to Adria's shack for a witch's viewpoint. You must be ever watchful, for Flesh Doom is an enemy who is both cruel and quick. His ebon blade is composed of the essence of evil. If you can destroy both of them, it would do much to weaken his dark master. Adamant this will harm Diablo and the forces of the Burning Hells, wasting not another second, we tepidly step into the Burning Hells once more to gingerly pick up Shadowfang. I can see why they fear this weapon. With no time to spare, we rush back to Tremaine with the blade. Light be praised! You found the cursed demon blade! Only its destruction can ensure the safety of us all! Wait! 
What treachery is this? Oh, it burns! Hellfire consuming me! You must take this to the Hellfort and cast it in before a... No! What unspeakable treachery has befallen poor Tremaine? He's eviscerated where he stands by this foul blade, soul presumably dragged into the blade and body rendered sunder in one last mocking act of defiance by flesh doom. This blade must be destroyed. As this is cut content, no other villagers unfortunately react to Tremaine's death, but the man they call Decad Kane does have a clue on the Hellforge Tremaine spoke of. The priest Tremaine is a holy man from an ancient order. Their dealings with the evil forces at work are well respected and well documented. I too have heard legends that speak of the cursed demon blade called Shadow Fang. It is said to consume the tortured souls of its victims. These souls are trapped within its ebon blade and augment its unholy power. I have also read of a great hell forge where even the mightiest weapon could be created or destroyed. Tread carefully when dealing with Shadow Fang and its master, lest you be drawn into the sword as well. The Hellforge, of course, is featured prominently in Diablo 2, and it seems we have the unenviable task of venturing down to find the Hellforge ourselves and destroy the blade. It's in level 14 of the Burning Hells, past a nasty nest of golden vipers, we come across a lone switch with three pressure pads. By unlocking each in the correct sequence, it opens the path to the infamous Hellforge, girt by the river of flame. It's hot down here. It's here we encounter a plethora of Balrog variants, including sub-bosses like Brutalus the Strong. The flame spewing cold enchanted barren denial of Grimm. And waves of obsidian founders and overlords teeming on this endless sea of lava, at the end of which Hephasto awaits at the entrance of the forge. Enchanted with haste and a particularly nasty poison, if allowed to close the gap and standing in a puddle of damage, he will make sure even the most prepared adventurer is felled easily. <laughs> Better equipped and prepared to tread lightly around his poison puddles, we face Hephasto once more. Finally, felling Hephasto, he drops a myriad of loot, one such item being his Hell Forge Hammer, pivotal in destroying Shadowfang. We then equip the hammer and head to the anvil. I'd have to equip that. Destroying Shadowfang, we are gifted with a mysterious mace as a plume of light engulfs the blade. Thank the light. With the harrowing quest at an end, a grim fate for Tremaine, we head to Decad Kane to learn of this mace. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. We then identify the fabled Light Forge Maze, which, as a part of the original game code, modders have coveted for some time, with plus 8 to all attributes, 25 chance to hit, 150% enhanced damage, and an impressive 20 to 30 fire hit damage and 30% light radius, plus being indestructible to boot. It seems the light has taken pity on us for the tumultuous experience we have just witnessed and been gifted quite a formidable mace for the looming evil of the Lord of Terror himself, Diablo, in the trials ahead. But what do you think of Flesh Doom Quest? Do you wish it was in game? It's such a shame that one man you want on your side during an invasion of the devil incarnate, a priest, Tremaine, died in vain to stop a demon's foul machinations. Once the player has entered the 12th level of hell, heading back to town and approaching Wirt, the peg-legged boy, he muses, where is that stupid map? It was supposed to be between the rock and the tree before the bridge. Should be right here. Oh, hello there. Didn't uh, see you standing there. So, 
word speaks of a lost map between a rock and a tree, eh? Sounds like we may want to get our hands on it before he hobbles about to find it himself. So we approach Pepin, the healer, to see if he knows anything about this lost map, which has started the quest, Lost Treasure, in our journal. To which he says, I really don't have time to discuss some map you are looking for. I have many sick people that require my help, and yours as well. Well, it seems Pepin has stepped into the role of Ogden for a change, rebuking us for seeking out this lost treasure. We might as well check with the town scholar Deckard Kane to see if he has overheard anything or if he'll be a little bit nicer about it. There was a time when this town was a frequent stop for travelers from far and wide. Much has changed since then, but hidden caves and buried treasure are common fantasies of any child. Wirt seldom indulges in youthful games, so it may just be his imagination. Ah, so Cain thinks this is just a child's game, but so too did the villagers doubt Farnan in our previous episode. Speaking of our inebriated comrade, let's check down with Farnham for clues as he is plopped down by his favourite drinking rock. Hey, let me see that. <coughs> Thanks. Ugh, Farnham, after fouling an unnamed item of ours, seemingly fabric, has cleared his nose, but we know not much more. So we pop back up to Griswold, who we saw commiserating with Kane. A what? This is foolishness! There's no treasure buried here in Tristram! Let me see that. Uh, look, these drawings are inaccurate. They don't match our town at all! I'd keep my mind on what lies below the cathedral, and not what lies below our topsoil. I have no idea what or which map Griswold refers to, but he seems a bit perturbed by the idea we're seeking treasure versus fighting the forces of hell. Maybe this is a common theme with travellers and looters who do more harm than good recently in Tristram. So we speak to Ogden, the tavern owner. I'll bet that Wirt saw you coming and put on an act just so he could laugh at you later when you're running around the town with your nose in the dirt. Well, it seems the townsfolk trust the slippery ginger nut known as Wirt as far as they can throw him. And with his girth, I'd say that's probably not very far. Also far removed is Adria, who never seems bothered by Wirt. And maybe she has a lead. Maintain your quest. Finding a treasure that is lost is not easy. Finding a treasure that is hidden, less so. I will leave you with this. Do not let the sands of time confuse your search. Well, although Adria tried to be poignant, it still just seems like more riddles. She basically said, don't waste time looking for a quest. Hmm. Unsure with our last clue gone cold, we trudge up to Jillian the barmaid, albeit a bit desperately. As we head to Jillian, we spy what appears to be a map plumb between a rock and a tree, not a stone's throw from Wirt. His little I peg leg must have anymore. betrayed him and we've happened upon the map. Hmm. Before he has, we race and pick it up and it says, that it will show us the location of this treasure on the mini-map, which appears to be just over the river. So we quickly consult with Jillian, who says, How a treasure map? Do you have it with you? Let me see. Hmm. It looks like this is pretty old, and some of the buildings in the town are not on this map. Oh, I wish I could go and look for the treasure with you, but I have to start work soon. Well. It looks like we're after a treasure hunt solo. Better leave Jillian to look after her grandmammy. Heading west out of town, our minimap marker leads us to a cave. We head inside to find a strange blue liquid permeating the bottom of a dingy cave floor. What treasure is worth going in this dark and uninviting cave remains to be seen. 
As we cautiously round the first corner, the wall reveals its facade as a pack of vipers pounce. Caught off guard, we cast the town portal or two, realizing our spells are improperly equipped, not before slaying the vipers, the old-fashioned way, with sword and steel against flesh. Note to self, always check spells. As we round the next corner, a viper, known as Boral Goral, explodes out of a hidden passageway. But not even this unique with his enhanced strength can fell us at this level. As we blow out some barrels, another false wall reveals an even bigger pack of Viper variants. Sick of being ambushed and switching gears into a true exterminator, which is what we basically have become, we start to utilize fire spells like Firewall to flush out the Vipers and illuminate our way. It's then we step unwittingly into a barrage of Viper Venom. These champions are resistant to fire, it seems, with their leader Bloodsnot lazily effusing bolts of lightning and wads of snot-colored acid. If this is a callback to Farnham, it's the most meta one yet. We clear out the greater opening with more of this strange blue liquid on an island in the middle, yet we find a no closer to answers in this maze of serpents. Although the room is cleared and seemingly we are at a dead end on our map, we once again spy a bevy of suspiciously placed barrels. As we enter an opening with another pool of water, Aiden remarks, Just what I was looking for. And we find a bunch of random loot, no doubt the reward for navigating this nasty nest. However, there still remains another few barrels in the corner. Hmm. It could blow up the whole village. As the barrels erupt and unlock a further area called Into the Unknown. Strange. This looks like we could have blown clear back into a subterranean layer of the cathedral. This cannot bode well for us. Damn it, Wirt. I just wanted precious treasure. As we step forward, we see eerily lit rooms and red campfires with a void beneath a path. This does not bode well at all. We pull a lever and are confronted by an Archmage Amalric, who is blessed with fire enchants, but not much HP as we fell him without fuss. With another few levers pulled, we are confronted by dead caller Zakaltl, who is a nasty necromancer, and although maneuvers well, we outpace him and put him down. Again, the third quadrant around the main room appears and a blood mage, Aratus, who likes a cheeky firewall himself, but is no match for us close quarters. Each mage gifting us knowledge through their hidden spell times, items, and a myriad of scrolls to use. It's quite the boon. However, before we celebrate, we need to keep our wits about us as we finally enter the last room. We've remarked to ourselves about- I've got a bad feeling about this. When confronted by Sergius the heretic, the supposed ringleader in the room laconically shooting torrents of lightning from his safe perch. As we breach the gap, thinking victory is assured, in a display of raw displeasure, he resurrects all of the previous felled wizards we just fought. Suddenly, we have flame walls, firebolts, and spells inundating our personal space. One by one, we track down the wizards using our own insanity spell, granting us a boon in speed and power. But the cost is fatigue as it wears off quickly, so we rush the final wizard before we're exhausted, and Aiden remarks, Time to die. Gifted a small bounty, we gather up the items before heading back to town, 
one of which is curiously called the symbol of the abandoned gods. Identifying the gold mace we received to be crack rust, which boasts plus 7 to all attributes, plus 75% damage, fire hit damage 6 to 12, resist all 5%, it's indestructible and only restricted until level 5, however all spells are decreased by one level, which is huge. I guess it's okay for a low level warrior, but even then, as we are reliant on spells in the Beelzebub mod, we may as well sell it. With that, we take a closer look at this curious symbol of the abandoned god, which gives our current character a whopping three points to all base attributes. A gift gratefully accepted. Well, that was a strange quest. In the end, we see Word has nothing more to say and we're left with nothing more to do but to head back to hell, better equipped for the road ahead. I must be getting close. In the town of Tristram, the entrance to hell appears as a blood red crevice in the earth behind Pepin's clinic and upon entering it, we exclaim, I must be getting close. As we witness the bone architecture and gore of poor adventurers and villagers before us, strewn about in a decorative fashion, no doubt to the liking of the Lord of Terror himself. Upon exploring the level, we're descended upon by a pack of deadly doom guards, which we dispose of through great effort as they are engulfed in a ball of flame. <coughs> It's then we attempt to head down to level 14 and a step closer to the Lord of Terror himself. But see, our path is blocked. Surrounded by the Great Bone Staircase is a thorny room adorned with a plethora of weapons and armors. Unable to find a way inside, we continue our search for an alternate route. Feeling our way through the hellish nightmare, we happen upon a gut-wrenching sight. More bodies impaled on spikes by two burning crucifixes, and in the middle, a lone tome sits upon a pedestal. We attempt to read the cover that is inscribed as the Steel Tome, as a massive Balrog creeps its way through the darkness before we're forced to eviscerate its corpse. <laughs> The armories of Hell are home to the Warlord of Blood. In his wake lay the mutilated bodies of thousands. Angels and man alike have been cut down to fulfill his endless sacrifices to the Dark Ones who scream for one thing. Blood. It's then we hear in the distance the sound of a door unlocking and instinctually know the Warlord will aise in wait, inviting us to his armory of hell. We resolve to stop the bloody sacrifices and portal back to town to learn of any information on this Warlord of Blood and pray for safe passage into the bowels of hell itself, if such a thing is possible. Back in town, we then see the witch Adria by her hut, who forebodes. His prowess with the blade is awesome, and he has lived for thousands of years knowing only warfare. I am sorry, I cannot see if you will defeat him. What a grim assessment. Heaven only knows how powerful a warlord would become over a thousand years of conflict. We then see the resident armorer, Griswold the blacksmith, about our chances, but he warns. Dark and wicked legend surrounds the one warlord of blood. Be well prepared, my friend, for he shows no mercy or quarter. Well, thanks to Griswold, at least we have an edge. We then search for Farnham the Drunk by his usual rock, but curiously, he's nowhere to be found. So instead, we seek out Pepin the Healer, who redirects. Kane would be able to tell you much more about something like this than I would ever wish to know. It's then we pass Wirt's tree and also see the boy has moved, so instead we speak to Jillian the barmaid out front of her grandmother's hut. If you are to battle such a fierce opponent, may light be your guide and your defender. I will keep you in my thoughts. We thank Jillian and then turn to see Wirt the peg-legged merchant by a new tree who admits. I haven't ever dealt with this warlord you speak of, but he sounds like he's going through a lot of swords. Wouldn't mind supplying his armies. Thanks, Wirt. 
The fate of Tristram hangs in the balance, and you'd supply the enemy. That's patriotism for you. Over by his inn, we speak to Ogden, the innkeeper, who says, I'm afraid that I haven't heard anything about such a vicious warrior, good master. I hope that you do not have to fight him, for he sounds extremely dangerous. Well, he's right about one thing. We're not looking forward to fighting him. Next, we see Farnham the Drunk plopped against the side of the inn by the path out of town and realize the residents have moved due to the crack to hell opening in close proximity to the sleepy hamlet. And who can blame them? However, Farnham seems in a rather optimistic, albeit inebriated mood, questioning. Always you gotta talk about blood. What about flowers and sunshine? And that pretty girl that brings the drinks. Listen here, friend. You're obsessive, you know that? I'm sure Jillian appreciates your ogling, Farnham. But he is right. Flowers and sunshine could be a metaphor for optimism, which is all but snuffed out, thanks to Diablo's stranglehold. Lastly, we realize our only hope to bring the light back to Tristram may be in the Warlord's backstory. So we speak next to Cain the Elder by his familiar well, who instructs. I know of only one legend that speaks of such a warrior as you describe. His story is found within the ancient chronicles of the Sin War. Stained by a thousand years of war, blood, and death, the Warlord of Blood stands upon a mountain of his tattered victims. His dark blade screams a black curse to the living, a tortured invitation to any who would stand before this executioner of hell. It is also written that although he was once a mortal who fought beside the Legion of Darkness during the Sin War, he lost his humanity to his insatiable hunger for blood. Our only consoling thought is that he was once mortal, and therefore he surely can perish once more. Back down on level 14, possessed lava moors block our path to the Warlord's domain. Enchanted with colds, they explode in plumes of frost, and we are nearly rendered frozen by the spell. <coughs> Any more potential ambushes, we head north up the western arm of the bone-laden maze. There we encounter a vast room full of dead adventurers and piles of gold. This must be the mountain of bodies that Cain spoke of. Atop it sits a single doom guard, but he is not alone. A trap springs as his champion comrades file in to surround us, spraying wicked licks of lightning as they fall with a final frightening farewell. Victorious, we take a moment to recuperate, picking up the treasures, no doubt invaluable to our fight to come, but realize None of these hellish knights were the Warlord of Blood himself. Heading back to the armory, a Steel Lord rushes to face us as we bolster ourselves to contend with his companion. And remember, our stone curse from the Chamber of Bone, and cast it, and use all our might to hack at the stony foe. However, due to his now solid countenance, it comes at the cost of precious endurance. Time to die. Weakened. It's then the Warlord of Blood himself appears from the shadows. My blade seeks for your blood, Mort. <laughs> We're now heavily fatigued and race backwards to desperately find a vantage point. We then realize we must contend with his army of steel lords one by one if we stand any chance at success, lest we're overwhelmed. A messy and harrowing fight, we fell the remainder of Steel Lords and land successful blow after blow against the Warlord of Blood, who, regardless, presses his attack with his mighty strength, pushing us back to the northeastern side of his armory. We dig our heels into the ground and drive Griswold's edge into his breastplate, proclaiming, Your reign of pain has ended. With that, We've finished the execution of thousand year bloody reign of terror. Learning from the treachery of the past, we cautiously move through the room, collecting weapons and armor for the battle against the hells once more, as the penultimate level 15 is now open for us to explore, bringing us one step closer to the treacherous Archbishop Lazarus and the Lord of Terror himself, Diablo in the bowels of hell. Fire!
Barnum is often confused, but he speaks a powerful name when the word Iswal passes his lips. Cain would be able to tell you in much greater detail the legend of this warrior. The original wicked tale of Azul can be started once the player has entered level 15 of the Burning Hells and travels back to town. At this point, you can approach Jillian the barmaid, and she says, Pray your pardon, but I have something to tell you that you may find interesting. It was the strangest thing. While drinking at the tavern, Farnham was rambling about something called Azurath. He also said something about a fallen angel. It was hard to understand him because he was very drunk and disoriented, but I seem to remember something about a key in a barrel. He also kept covering his face and repeating the word Iswal over and over again. What a confusing bunch of clues we are given. Farnham supposedly talks about something called Azure Wrath, a fallen angel and a key in a barrel, which may be pivotal to solving this mystery, and all the while, he was supposedly covering his face. Curious about the new quest, the dialogue is initiated called Azul, the Fallen Angel. We head to Farnham to hopefully decipher these clues. <laughs> Did you ever hear the one of the cane tails? <laughs> I love that one. Thank you, Farnham. No mention of barrels and keys, angels or Azure wrath, just drunken and giggling. So we saunter over to our only solid lead thus far, the town scholar, Deckard Kane. Farnham has taken to drinking quite heavily since his encounters in the labyrinth. But within the ramblings of this drunken man rests a legend well steeped in myth and mystery. Sit for a moment, my friend, and let me tell you of his wall and Azure Wrath. The saga of Iswal takes place during the lost battles in Hell. Iswal was an angel who was given charge of the Holy Ruin Blade, Azurath. Leading a daring assault on the Hell Forge, Iswal was set upon by hundreds of blackened demons and was fatally wounded. The fiends cast the dying angel into a dark pit where the powers of chaos transformed him as he drowned in a whirlpool of burning blood. Evil possessed his wall. The feathers of his wings burned away to reveal leathery skin and horns ripped through the flesh of his head. When he finally arose from that black pit, his wall was an angel no more. Transformed into a creature of evil, he was once again given charge of Azurath, assuring that the blade would never again be used against the denizens of hell. What an unbelievably wicked tale to take Demon's Bane Azurath from the Angel Azul, cast him into the abyss, having his wings burned away as he's consumed by a new demonic form, and wickedly making sure that Azurath is only used to protect evil and never against the Hell's forces themselves. If I may make a quick aside, as the character and his blade are of course legendary in the series, and show off the infamous concept art of Chris Metzen, showing this hellish scene taking place. Notably, as mentioned by Kane, angels in Diablo 1 still had feathery wings and visible flesh versus their light counterparts, which were revised later. Speaking of weapons, we should see what the town blacksmith Griswold has to say on the fate of Azure Wrath. The blade Azure Wrath! Ugh, it's legend! It was cast by the angelic weaponsmith Synodeed and tempered within the fires of judgment. Whoever wields this weapon will find the legions of hell at his feet. If you found this blade, I would begin to truly believe that you could end the nightmare that has befallen our town. It's clear this coveted weapon of the high heaven should never have fallen into the demon's hands, and we can only lament its devious repurposing. It's also quite amazing the blade is famous enough for most of the townsfolk to be aware of it. So, as we leave the well, we see Ogden, the innkeeper, and if he has further knowledge of the sword. There is an old story of an angel named Iswal, but I don't remember much more than that. 
Although not much is gained, it's clear that this is a shared fable in Tristram, and so we head to Wirt, who says, If you were to find any trace of Iswal or the Blade Azurath, even I would be impressed. That is definitely one of a kind. Even Wirt seems to revere this blade versus his less than stellar reaction to Shadowfang, its seemingly dark counterpart. As we have learned what we can, all that is left is to head to Adria the Witch, second to only Cain in terms of knowledge of the high heavens and burning hells. The once proud Iswal is trapped deep beneath the surface of this world. His honor stripped and his visage altered, he is trapped in immortal torment charged to conceal the very thing that could free him. What a cruel fate to be put in charge of a holy weapon by the high heavens, be torn apart by demonic legions and remade in a pool of blood in the abyss, Azul himself trapped in a demonic unholy form, and to add insult to injury to be put in charge of said weapon again with the opposite intent. Heading down to level 15, we search for this mysterious room Farnham spoke of, left to contend with hordes of snow witches firing torrents of blue cold bolts at us and dastardly cabalists whirring wicked licks of lightning in chains before promptly teleporting to safer ground. A maddening affair for a warrior whose only way to breach the distance is to trudge at them one by one. But finally, we come across the fabled room full of barrels as we use a lightning spell to open the barrels and they explode in unison. No keys are found. So with that, we head back to town in search of clues from the source Jillian. You know, now that I think about it, maybe it wasn't a key in a barrel, but a barrel that was the key. Does that make any more sense? So the barrels are the key underneath which all there is is a pad that looks like some type of warp point. Out of ideas again, we teleport back to town. However, like the butcher's chamber, this too must have been a clue, and an eerie crimson portal leading to the Temple of the Damned opens, and it makes sense that the barrels were shaped themselves like a portal and hiding the pedestal underneath. In this green floored dimension, we are immediately set upon blood knights and doomsayers with overwhelming frost attacks, and we make a hasty retreat as soon as we thaw and start using the walls as cover to thin the herd, lest we be hacked down as a warrior sized ice cube. After clearing the room, we spy a pedestal where it's clear we must insert some kind of key or unlock it somehow. First, heading to the northwest room, we are met by a unique blood knight named Catalan Lefares, the Destroyer, boasting abilities of being extra strong and a nasty charge with fire enchantment. He nearly drops us in one hit, and we're only able to just hack through his defenses with our own nasty stun lock against the wall, thanks to the cleave ability. After which we find a switch in the furthest room and head south to find its assumed second counterpart in the rooms below. It's then we are promptly ambushed by a group of doomsayers, a move which is cold even for them. Swathing a path through the remainder of the pack, we unlock the second switch and a door opens above us. It's here we're forced to face the Overlord. Arch Rector, Repershag, a demon clearly well versed in the art of fire conjuration. Only by using the bone built walls and utilizing a vantage point do we quickly burn him down before his brethren have a chance to fell us. <laughs> Upon defeat, he will drop the temple's keystone and as well a much needed tower shield named Bonewing, which boasts enhanced defenses, plus 40% to cold resist, thank you, and plus nine to vitality. After re-prepping our gear and supplies, we take the temple's keystone and place it on the grim pedestal. How much suffering, mortal, does it take before you lose your grace? Let me show you. 
with a macabre line about his fall, Azul opens his barrage of attacks with a deadly circle of cold, which is of course later his trademark. Although we are further protected from cold, it's not enough to save us from being slowed and Azul in his demonic form viciously pounces on us while we're vulnerable, hammering down our defenses with ease as we thirstily gulp potion after potion trying to stave off his ferocious assault. Juggling the onslaught of cold, potion management and utilizing his skills to burn down Azul's own defenses, we finally fell this foul demon. Light. Although the victory is bittersweet, Aiden remarks about his soul being freed of this ghastly demonic vessel. However, as we know, that isn't the case. But before we discuss this and we check his body for loot, and of course, One Piece is a very unique sword. Rushing back to town, we seek out Decked Kane to identify our bounty, especially this curious, unusable rapier. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. Identifying the sword, it turns out, of course, to be Azure Wrath. Having plus 10 to all attributes, a plus 35% chance to hit, cold hit damage is a whopping plus 8 to 20, plus 25 increased attack speed, and minus 40% requirements so that we can use it straight away, plus 50 damage to undead, which no doubt specifically was imbued upon its creation, and as a weapon of the high heavens, a 5% chance to cast Holy Bolt on striking. What a remarkable blade, fit for any agent of light, and freezing enemies where they stand. Of course, this blade does make an appearance in the sequels, and Zul himself does too. However, this story does take take a darker turn, as he is still a fallen angel in Diablo 2, trapped in demonic form. And we learn his canon backstory of how he betrayed the high heavens upon his capture and was instrumental to the primevals corrupting the soul stones. Tyrion was a fool to have trusted me. You see, it was I who told Diablo and his brothers about the soul stones and how to corrupt them. It was I who helped the prime evils mastermind their own exile to your world. The plan we set in motion so long ago cannot be stopped by any mortal agency. Hell itself is poised to spill forth into your world like a tidal wave of blood and nightmares. You and all your kind are doomed. Another tidbit I found fascinating about Azul that we learned later horrifically is that unlike a normal angel that when they perish they will reform in the high heavens as a new angelic being, Azul is now technically a demon and when he is perished in Diablo 2 he will just come back as a demon in Diablo 3. Something unprecedented, though it is of course a characteristic trait of demons themselves, hence why the primevals can resurrect. Tyrael himself actually has a somewhat similar trademark as he is the only angel to have reformed when he died destroying the world stone instead of dissipating and reforming as a new angel. So it seems that even though Azul was one of his own trusted lieutenants in the past, they are bonded by this regeneration which is very unique to both of them. But that is a story for another time. After our harrowing battle with the ex-angel Iswal, we find our companion, the rogue Morena, in town, who instructs that while we recuperate, she will take the lead by further investigating the crack to hell anomaly that is opened behind Pepin's infirmary. Venturing deep into the bone and gore strewn level 14 of the burning hells, and after fighting through what feels like scores of blood knights, and a particularly nasty nest of fire drakes, we happen upon a curiosity. One blood knight stays steadfast and does not lift his blade as we slay his brethren. His name appears to be Lakdanan, and for all accounts, we cannot attack him. So instead, we approach him and he says, Please, don't kill me, just hear me out. I was once captain of King Leoric's knights upholding the laws of this land with justice and honor. Then his dark curse fell upon us for the role we played in his tragic death. As my fellow knights succumbed to their twisted fate, I fled from the king's burial chamber, searching for some way to free myself from the curse. I failed. 
I have heard of a golden elixir that could lift the curse and allow my soul to rest, but I have been unable to find it. My strength now wanes, and with it, the last of my humanity as well. Please, aid me and find the elixir. I will repay your efforts. I swear upon my honor. What a cruel fate that has befallen those loyal to Leoric. Lakdanan has tragically informed us that he was one of King Leoric's royal guard, but as Diablo corrupted the king, he cursed the knights to serve the Lord of Terror in darkness for eternity. All the royal guards turned into evil mockeries of their former selves, save one, Lakdanan. Leoric since slain rose anew as the undead skeleton king, which we encountered earlier and ultimately killed ourselves in his second undead form, so he may be laid to rest. As a side note, although not yet canon in Diablo 1, it is later recognized that it was indeed the warrior Aiden's father, making slaying him a darker turn for the overall tragedy. Rest well, Leoric. I'll find your son. What inner strength the just and loyal Lakdanan must possess to have retained some semblance of his sanity where his former comrades could not, twisted and turned into these Blood Knight aberrations. To attempt to help free Lakdanan of his curse, as he could not himself, searching the rest of level 14 to no avail, we venture back to town through a portal to learn what we can of this strange yellow elixir he mentioned and hopefully get some further insight from the townsfolk on how to obtain it so he finally may be free. As we enter town, we first happen upon Ogden, who may have insight into the night as he was a fixture during Leoric's reign. Greetings, good master. Welcome to the Tavern of the Rising Sun. You speak of a brave warrior long dead. I'll have no such talk of speaking with departed souls in my inyard. Thank you very much. Clearly a sore subject for Ogden, either due to his fear of demonic ilk or past reverence for the memory of his fallen king and his subjects. So we instead turn our attention to Jillian, the barmaid. Hopefully a rumor or whisper of the elixir has met her ears. Good day. How may I serve you? I've never heard of a Lakdanan before. I'm sorry, but I don't think that I can be of much help to you. With nothing of note to add from Jillian, Pepin the town healer stands a door down and hopefully we will have more insight into this strange elixir's properties. What ails you, my friend? A golden elixir, you say? I have never concocted a potion of that color before, so I can't tell you how it would affect you if you were to try to drink it. As your healer, I strongly advise that should you find such an elixir, do as Lockdonan asks and do not try to use it. Feeling not much closer to an answer but getting somewhere, an expert on imbibing dangerous elixirs, although admittedly a long shot, we sauntered down to Farnham the Drunk's drinking spot where he's plopped himself in front of a nice rock at the south of town. Time to fellow drink in peace? Like down and it's dead. Everybody knows that, and you can't fool me into thinking any other way. You can't talk to the dead. I know. Humorously, we can only guess in what way Farnham has attempted to talk to the dead. Perhaps Farnham is right though and we need to aim our sights on the living, but also one that is well versed in dead arts and forbidden knowledge. We head to the centre of town, to Decker Kane, in search of more grounded wisdom. Hello my friend, stay a while and listen. You claim to have spoken with Loch Donnan? He was a great hero during his life. Lakdanan was an honorable and just man who served his king faithfully for years. But of course you already know that. For those who were caught within the grasp of the king's curse, Lakdanan would be the least likely to submit to the darkness without a fight. So I suppose that your story could be true. If I were in your place, my friend, I would find a way to release him from his torture. Kane, although imparting the most useful wisdom for us, muses our claims of meeting believed long dead Lockdown and sketchy at best. But what would we gain from lying about a fallen knight? Although he does hold him in reverence and urges us to help him, maybe we can have a more grounded solution with the town blacksmith Griswold. Well, what can I do for you? If it is actually Lockdown that you've met, then I would advise that you aid him. 
I dealt with him on several occasions and found him to be honest and loyal in nature. The curse that fell upon the followers of King Leoric would fall especially hard upon him. Although Griswold doesn't guide us in terms of an elixir, the general consensus in town is he was a good man and the townsfolk fervently agree we should help him if we can. Perhaps we can call on the darker arts, and so we stop by Adria's shack in search of answers. I sense a soul in search of answers. You may meet people who are trapped within the labyrinth, such as Lachdanan. I sense in him honor and great guilt. Aid him, and you aid all of Tristram. With that, scrounging for clues, our last desperate gambit for help is heading back to Wirt, the fork-tongued pegleg boy, for any kind of lead or maybe a weapon to aid us. Psst, over here. Wait, let me guess. Cain was swallowed up in a gigantic fissure that opened beneath him. He was incinerated in a ball of hellfire and can't answer your questions anymore. Oh, that isn't what happened? Then I guess you'll be buying something, or you'll be on your way. Wirt, although having some choice words and expensive items is no more help, so we stock up in town and head back through the portal for the elusive elixir. Having scoured level 14 to no avail, we speak to Luck Dunnan once more. You have not found the golden elixir. I fear that I am doomed for eternity. Please. Keep trying. Hesitantly, we surmise, it seems we will be forced to venture deeper into the burning hells for the mysterious potion we seek. Down to level 15, the setting marred with bone and hellfire alike. We tepidly clear room by room, chock full of azure drakes, and now peppered with torrents of succubi variants, flinging dark magic from every direction. In our search, we stumble into a particularly nasty sub-boss, aptly named Bloodlust, especially when she's aided by her sisters or if you're rushed by drakes while trying to dodge a barrage of magic missiles. Forced to backtrack, letting a stream of arrows loose with a steady thrum of our bow, we finally fell Bloodlust and collect a nice field plate off her corpse. After felling countless enemies, we pass a peculiar pentagram marking Lazarus's portal in the main quest, and in the next room we spy the golden elixir, barely visible but accompanied by a flagpost or corpse unceremoniously impaled sideways on a spear next to a rather angry azure drake guard. I need to get this to Lakdano. Absconding with the potion, we hurry back to Loch Darnan, hoping that he has endured in our absence. You have saved my soul from damnation, and for that, I am in your debt. If there is ever a way that I can repay you from beyond the grave, I will find it. But for now, take my helm. On the journey I'm about to take, I will have little use for it. May it protect you against the dark powers below. Go with the light, my friend. And with that, Lakdanan is freed from his undead coil and dies horrifically in front of our eyes. No longer bound to his demonic form and, as promised, rewards us with a helm dropped as he perishes called the Veil of Steel. Anxious to see the new Helm's properties and depart hell, we portal back to town. Upon closer inspection, we find the Veil of Steel has a penalty of minus 30 to mana, making it maybe less appealing for a mage. However, it is arguably one of the most useful unique Helms for any character, especially warriors, who can afford the mana penalty. It increases both strength and vitality highly and is noted for being the only Helm and armor holding a 50% to all resistances along with augmented base armor class as well as a bonus to the formerly mentioned and the only great Helm requiring no strength to be equipped. Unfortunately, and maybe a tongue-in-cheek reference, Lakdanan's last words to us are, go with the light, my friend, and the helm has minus 22 light radius. With Lakdanan's soul freed, we can rest easier knowing we have at least aided the light in some small manner for now. 
but the burning hells call us, and Lazarus, the bastard archbishop, is still afoot. So we head into the burning hells once more. But this is not the end of Lakdanan's tale, and part two of this video will cover actually seeing the events between Lakdanan and King Leoric as the story is furthered in the main quest line of Diablo 3. Thanks again for watching. Let me know what you'd like me to cover in the future videos between the next Lakdanan tale, and until next time, Traveler. In level 16 of hell, we battle through the serpentine azure drakes and see what can only be described as an unholy display. Human bodies spiked on spears in various contorted states, surrounded by a single staff on a rack, and realize this must be the staff of the betrayer, Lazarus himself. Killing a final stealth drake that tries in vain to protect the artifact, we portal back to town, staff in hand, and race to the town elder, Deckard Kane, hoping he can help unlock its secrets and turn the tide of war. It's then he finally reveals his true nature, confiding, This does not bode well, for it confirms my darkest fears. While I did not allow myself to believe the ancient legends, I cannot deny them now. Perhaps the time has come to reveal who I am. My true name is Deckard Cain, the Elder, and I am the last descendant of an ancient brotherhood that was dedicated to safeguarding the secrets of a timeless evil, an evil that quite obviously has now been released. The Archbishop Lazarus, once King Leoric's most trusted advisor, led a party of simple townsfolk into the labyrinth to find the king's missing son, Albrecht. Quite some time passed before they returned, and only a few of them escaped with their lives. Curse me for a fool! I should have suspected his veiled treachery then. It must have been Lazarus himself who kidnapped Albrecht and has since hidden him within the labyrinth. I do not understand why the Archbishop turned to the darkness or what his interest is in the child, unless he means to sacrifice him to his dark masters. That must be what he has planned. The survivors of his rescue party say that Lazarus was last seen running into the deepest bowels of the labyrinth. You must hurry and save the prince from the sacrificial blade of this demented fiend. Utterly shocked by the revelation, we resolve to save our brother Albrecht from Lazarus' sacrificial blade before it's too late. We turn then and ask Griswold about Lazarus' last known location, and he shares. Ah, I was there when Lazarus led us into the labyrinth. He spoke of holy retribution, but when we started fighting those hellspawn, he did not so much as lift his mace against them. He just ran deeper into the dim, endless chambers that were filled with the servants of darkness. So, he's deep inside some chambers we are yet to discover. We know that Wirt the peg-legged boy was himself dragged from the labyrinth thanks to the bravery of Griswold and some other townsfolk, and ask him if he saw anything, and he says, Yes, the righteous Lazarus, who is so effective against those monsters down there, and didn't help save my leg, did it? Look, I'll give you a free piece of advice. Ask Farnham, he was there. We pity Wirt and his lost leg, and also didn't want Farnham to have to relive the horrors of what Lazarus put him through, especially as our last conversation went so poorly. Griswold? Good old Griswold. I love him like a brother. We fought together, you know, back when we... Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus! But we must save our brother and press him, to which he fitfully blathers. They stab, then bite, then they're all around you. Liar, liar! They're all dead, dead! Do you hear me? They just keep falling and falling. The blood spilling out all over the floor. Oh, his fault. 
We then rest a hand on poor Farnham's shoulder and console him, heading next to the healer Pepin about the fallen archbishop who recalls. I was shocked when I heard of what the townspeople were planning to do that night. I thought that of all people, Lazarus would have had more sense than that. He was an archbishop and always seemed to care so much for the townsfolk of Tristram. So many were injured, I could not save them all. Perhaps Lazarus did once care, but that time has passed. It's then we see Ogden, who saunters over, hearing our conversation, and shares. Lazarus was the archbishop who led many of the townspeople into the labyrinth. I lost many good friends that day, and Lazarus never returned. I suppose he was killed along with most of the others. If you would do me a favor, good master, please do not talk to Farnham about that day. Damn. We're a little bit late on that one. We turn to see Gillian the barmaid, who is now loitering out front of the Tavern of the Rising Sun. She seems restless, and upon our approach, she remembers. I remember Lazarus as being a very kind and giving man. He spoke at my mother's funeral, and was supportive of my grandmother and myself in a very troubled time. I pray every night that somehow... He is still alive and safe. It seems Lazarus may have been one of the first to be corrupted by the Lord of Terror. We then seek out the resident demonologist Adria the Witch by her hut, and she confirms our suspicions. I did not know this Lazarus of whom you speak, but I do sense a great conflict within his being. He poses a great danger and will stop at nothing to serve the powers of darkness which have claimed him as theirs. Although, on some level, we pity Lazarus, we cannot, however, forgive his transgressions if he's harmed our younger sibling. And so, cursing his name under our breath, we head back down to hell once more. A stone's throw from Lazarus' staff stand were assaulted by a gaggle of azure drakes, accompanied by their fanatic variants, who are greatly empowered by the darkness of hell. We then realize that Diablo has sent some of his strongest forces to guard a crimson portal beside a sign of the Lord of Terror's power, a great pentagram on the ground, no doubt sending his minions into a frenzy. Guarding the portal is a score of balrogs and drakes and other enemies enemies that force us to dive through the gateway to the unknown realm beyond. We cross through the portal and into a room that is awash with a red hue as fire burns, yet seems to be oddly familiar, as if part of the cathedral next to town and not a part of hell itself. We leave the room and are hit with a red blood star from a winged hellspawn. We chase her down, but are immediately bombarded with more blood magic from her sisters caged in an eastern room. <laughs> Heading northwest instead, we see another room full of succubi that parallels the eastern counterpart. Following the red missiles down the hall, we see on the wall statues of the fallen King Leoric, confirming this is no longer hell, but some form of old area of worship attached to the cathedral. Stalking the hellspawn into the southern room, we are ambushed by more succubi and unholy super unique mages known as advocates. Flying fireballs and flash spells hit us when we dare to breach the gap and encounter them toe to toe as they teleport to and fro. Not after defeating the mages, we see a vile tome above a pentagram and read it, but are immediately transported to the northwestern room full of succubi. Contending with the lusty demons, we're left to rinse repeat on the other side of the building, nearly swarmed by the torrents of blood magic and evil harpies trying to fell us before we can make our way to the accursed archbishop. <sighs> <sighs> Exhausted from hacking through droves of fiends, we move to exit the building the way we came, but are instead transported into the heart of the lair of the lecherous Lazarus himself and realize this is his seat of power.
Abandon your foolish quest, or all that awaits you is the wrath of my master. You are too late to save the child. Now you will join him. Thoroughly taunted and nearly torn asunder from torrents of magics engulfing us from all sides, we retreat to the eastern room. With no time to check the identity of the dead sacrificed boy on his altar, we believe we're too late and cast a town portal to escape, but realize this may be our only chance to contend with the cowardly Lazarus and make him pay. Instead of fleeing, we turn heel and dart back and forth, hacking the legs from under the succubi bit by bit, evening the playing field. Lazarus, sensing our plan, blocks our path with multiple firewalls, the blaze rising like the fires of hell itself. The Archbishop then attempts to pin us in the western room where we take shelter, but we surprise him with a scroll of frozen orb that throws him off balance and allows us to make a last minute escape. Once again, we single out the Scarlet Witches and take out an errant councilman in our stride. The succubi then scatter, and we hunt the black and white pigmented black jade, who is lightning and arcane enchanted, and cunningly she leads us right back into the fray, lightning spewing from her hide whenever we manage to land a blow, however she dies in a heap in front of her kin. We then turn our attention to her sister, Red Vex now fearful of suffering the same fate, and she attempts to cower near the altar with the dead boy sacrificed atop it. Regardless, she falls next in front of the gothic artwork. Destroying the last of the Hellspawn sisters, we begin our hunt for the fallen priest and scream his name. Lazarus! Bastard! Sensing his presence, we become further enraged and declare, Time to die. We round the corner and see Lazarus by the town portal. He vanishes momentarily and we drive our blade into his abdomen, promising. Your business ends here, betrayer. <sighs> Lazarus, now ash, spills to the floor. He drops some paltry items on his body. We then remember, more importantly, his sacrifice and race back to the altar thanking the heavens to see it indeed was not our brother, Albrecht. Nonetheless, another poor soul sacrificed to the Lord of Terror himself. We pause to think, with Lazarus dead, we are one step closer to ending this madness. And then we notice a curiosity, a chest that the ex-archbishop seemed to be guarding, and inside is a map to the stars? We stash the map in our inventory, heading back to the newly identified Herodric scholar Deckard Cain, as it's no doubt a vital clue on our reckoning with Diablo himself. This is the story of Map of the Stars, and the quest's original appearance slated for Diablo 1, which was cut from the final game due to it profoundly changing how players experienced facing the Lord of Terror, Diablo, entirely. The quest can be initiated by entering Hell level 16 and entering the portal to the Unholy Altar. After we have learned of the treachery of the Archbishop Lazarus, so with his staff in hand, we head into his lair. Abandon your foolish quest, or all that awaits you is the wrath of my master. You are too late to save the child. Now you will join him. Face, fight, and fell the Archbishop Lazarus. We can open a large chest in the corner of the room in which we fight him and pick up the map of the stars. Uh -huh. And it initiates the quest. Looking at the map, it shows a sun in the sky and some type of lunar or star cycle. To learn more, we head to Deckard Kane in town. Upon showing him the map, he says, Your story is quite grim, my friend. Lazarus will surely burn in hell for his horrific deed. The boy that you describe is not our prince. But I believe that Albrecht may yet be in danger. 
The symbol of power that you speak of must be a portal in the very heart of the labyrinth. Know this, my friend. The evil that you move against is the Dark Lord of Terror. He is known to mortal men as Diablo. It was he who was imprisoned within the labyrinth many centuries ago, and I fear that he seeks to once again sow chaos in the realm of mankind. You must venture through the portal and destroy Diablo before it is too late. Our time is running short. I sense his dark power building, and only you can stop him from attaining his full might. Although Albrecht is not the boy we saw on Lazarus' altar, we now have confirmed to face the Lord of Terror himself, Diablo. To make matters much worse, we have unwittingly started the quest, the Lost Stars, in tandem. Not only do we have to defeat Diablo, but something foreboding, it seems, is set to transpire. Trying to somewhat hurriedly get perspective, we head to Griswold, who informs us. I've never seen a map of this sort before. Where'd you get it? Ugh, although I have no idea how to read this, Cain or Adrian may be able to provide the answers that you seek. So, we have a second lead. Adria, the witch, and her wisdom may help us before we head out of town. But first we speak to Farnham, perhaps one last time, for his guidance, to which he bemuses. Listen here, come close. I don't know if you know what I know, but you have really got something here. That's a map. My god, that was insightful. We will miss you, Farnham. But there's no time to reminisce, so we head to Pepin, who says... I can't make much of the writing on this map, but perhaps Adria or Kane could help you decipher what this refers to. I can see that it is a map of the stars in our sky, but any more than that is beyond my talents. Again, it seems like Adria may be our best bet, but what of the map of the stars? Maybe the moons will align like some old ritual? Hopping over yonder to Wirt first, he says. I've been looking for a map, but that certainly isn't it. You should show that to Adria. She can probably tell you what it is. I'll say one thing. It looks old. And old usually means valuable. Ah, a great reference to Wirt's own lost treasure quest we just completed. Speaking of old and valuable, let's try Jillian's grandmother to see if her visions can help. The best person to ask about that sort of thing would be our storyteller. Kane is very knowledgeable about ancient writings, and that is easily the oldest looking piece of paper that I have ever seen. It seems everyone is palming this off to Cain, rightfully so, a fabled Herodrum dealing with an old, unreadable map. Yet, we should also seek out Adria. As we head over to her shack, we spy Ogden, the tavern owner, in the light of his door, and briefly approach him to say, If the witch can't help you, and suggests that you see Cain, what makes you think that I would know anything? It sounds like this is a very serious matter. You should hurry along and see the storyteller, as Adria suggests. It sounds like I was meant to see Adria first to piece this one together, but Diablo is always fun how they jump around with the narrative. Regardless, we see Adria one last time at a shack beyond the border of town to help us decipher this map. Oh, I'm afraid this does not bode well at all. This map of the stars portends great disaster, but its secrets are not mine to tell. The time has come for you to have a very serious conversation with the storyteller. Well, that honestly wasn't very helpful. It seems like Cain was our best bet, so we know what we have to do already. Kill Diablo. Heading down beneath the pentagram near the unholy altar's portal in Terra's Domain. In the north room of Terra's Domain, if we step on four stones, we face Doom Lord Gamar. Give me a sacrifice. But beware, killing him quickly is crucial as he will literally overrun the entire lair with his spawned demons if left unchecked. When he is defeated, the East Room opens and we face the uber-strong Bloodlord, the Destroyer. 
When he is defeated, the West Room opens and we face the mage Benedict the Black. Here in the West Room, if you touch the three crucified skeletons, the South Room opens and you can finally face the Lord of Terror, Diablo. However, upon entering Terra's domain, if you fail to kill Diablo before one hour passes, your map of the stars shows the stars align and turn red, and Diablo is shown in a cutscene to power up. We hastily head back to town to speak to Kane, who gives us some grave news. I am sure that you tried your best. But I fear that even your strength and will may not be enough. Diablo is now at the height of his earthly power, and you will need all your courage and strength to defeat him. May the light protect and guide you, my friend. I will help in any way that I am able. Facing Diablo at this stage makes him almost impossible to beat, and he will gleefully stomp you and claw at your corpse for fun. This is the crux of the map of the stars. Basically, he has an enraged timer on top of the usual Diablo quest if you pick it up. However, restarting a game also resets the timer. We can fight our way again through Terra's domain and finally slay the Lord of Terra. Instead of the ending cinematic that we get in the vanilla game, you can now loot Diablo, a nice touch thanks to the Beelzebub mod linked in the description, as well as see Albrecht's macabre corpse. And if you pick up the Soul Stone and use it, it will end the game and initiate the cinematics, resetting Diablo afterwards. And the Map of the Stars countdown also resets, hence why it was initially removed, as it profoundly changed how players would encounter the end game of Diablo. But what did you think? Would you prefer to leave it in or take it out? as it forces you to rush through the end game and face Diablo, otherwise basically get stomped. Also, this is the final episode of cut content for Diablo. I just want to say thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of your comments with your profound insights into the game and also how much you have been appreciative of this series. It really is heartwarming and makes me want to make so much more content. I am currently hunting for more content based on Diablo and other RPGs in a similar style so I can maintain a consistent upload. So if you have any suggestions, let me know. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification to stay up to date with the posts and many thanks for making this series an absolute joy to play. As always, thanks for watching and until next time, Wanderer. The Soul Stone burns with hellfire as an eerie red glow blurs your vision. Fresh blood flows into your eyes and you begin to hear the tormented whispers of the damned. You have done what you knew must be done. The essence of Diablo is contained. For now. You pray that you have become strong enough to contain the demon and keep him at bay.
Although you have been fortified by your quest, you can still feel him, clawing his way up from the dark recesses of your soul. Fighting to retain control, your thoughts turn toward the ancient mystic lands of the Far East. Perhaps there, beyond the desolate wastes of Aranach, you will find an answer. Or perhaps, salvation.